Okay. All right. I'd like to call the meeting to order and to let the people in the room know this clock is incorrect. So just FYI. And any agenda changes or additions? Uh, there are not. Okay, thank you. Wait, wait a minute. We're doing a policy. Yep, yep. So well, it still stands. Yep. We, we had many changes proposed and withdrawn, so which <laughs> right up to the last minute, so. Yeah, so uh, to the under other business, so the executive session, uh, legal and personnel, not just legal. Okay, thank you. Is that the only change? Yeah, I think so. Yep. And approve the minutes for May 15th, 2023. We'll make a motion we approve the minutes from May 15th. I'll second. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed. Minutes approved. Uh, approved minutes from May 25th, Looking for a motion to approve the minutes from May 25th. So moved. Oh, second. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, the minutes have been approved from May 25th. Approve the minutes from June 6th, 2023. June 1st. June 1st. Oh, what did I June say? 1st. I can make a you said June 6th. I did. <laughs> All right. I'll make a motion to accept June 1st. Thank you. Okay, a motion and a second. And any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, minutes have been approved. New business, select board training. And this is me. And um, we're a new board. And this is, as far as I know, this is, hasn't been done before. Usually you get voted on a select board just to happen to the two of you and even and, and Don and myself and Chris. You just arrive and you're here and there isn't any cohesiveness or build, board building going on at all. Um, fortunately, Paula and Tina and Judy did some kind of orientation for the two of you and I think maybe for Chris. But I think when Don and I got on, there was a it was sink or swim, basically. Yeah, I went out and met as many of these people as I wanted to. Yeah, but you had to do it on your own. There wasn't anybody helping you with that. So um, I was looking at um, contacting BLTC to see if they had anybody who did leadership training, and there wasn't anything available. They did training on finances and open meeting laws and so on and so forth. So um, I found somebody, or someone found me, and this person can do building organizational trust kind of a trust consultant, and um, talk about what are our rules for a board. Um, develop a set of agreements with all of us. How do we function as a board? Um, and uh, so a new group of us working together to understand how we work with one another and how can we build more trust. So I was wanted to get the consensus from the board if you'd be interested. I. I will facilitate this person coming and they will do it um, for free for us. Yeah, I thought that would be a good selling point. Yep. Um, and we'd ha because of open meeting laws, we would be doing it at a, uh, a special meeting, but it wouldn't be a business meeting. It would just be a training for us. So the public is welcome to attend, but there would be no public input. It would just be for us. Yep. So I'm putting that out there to all of you. I don't know if we need a, uh, a motion for this or not, or just a general agreement. So this would be a special meeting, obviously. 
Correct. Do you have a time, an idea? My thought was next month. July? Yes. Sometime in July. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, me too. I love that idea. I'm just straight out schedule wise. It's because we're, you know, every week so far is two nights a week. Um, so I would say certainly, I love the idea of schedule and I hope I can make it, but it's, it's times becoming really tough right now. But. We'll see what we can do okay. to make it work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It doesn't have to be on a Monday. Yeah. So we can pick it. I'll, mm -hmm. Probably I can send an email out and say, what do some of these dates look like? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And sure. Don, you're you're okay with that too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Next, moving on to approve fireworks permit. The annual LACN uh, cancer walk is coming up, and they uh, have uh, annually had a uh, fireworks display as a at the culmination of that event and have submitted a, a application for a permit to the town. And we have signatures, although not in the packet, we do have signatures from the fire chief and the police chief on uh, that permit. And in line with that as well is our own 4th of July town fireworks. There's a permit in there as well for that. Same thing, fire chief, police chief has signed just looking for approval for both of those permits from the board. North Star is doing both of them, is that correct? They are. Do you need separate motions on each one? Uh, I'm fine if you do both in, in one. That's okay. I'll make a motion that we approve both of the firework uh, permits for lacing up uh, for Cancer Walk and the 4th of July for the town of Morristown. A second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? The cancer walk is on June 24th. <coughs> All right, I don't see any hands up. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion has passed. Next, approve EMS fiscal year 21 22 ambulance call write offs. This is Tina's. Every year, um, just before the end of the fiscal year, we always approve write-offs from the prior year. Um, and this year, as you have in front of you, these are people that were unable to pay and insurance wasn't something that they either had or they had insurance had paid and they had a portion they were supposed to pay but they couldn't afford to or they never contacted me at all. So um, the request to write off $39,390.28, um, that's roughly 11% of the billed calls. So this is a loss of revenue. This isn't a loss of money that we've paid out necessarily. I mean, obviously no, we responded <laughs> to these calls, so that cost right. us money, but. right. Didn't cost us thirty-one thousand dollars. No, no, nothing like that. Um, Forty-eight people paid nothing on their balance, which is thirty thousand six hundred and ninety dollars of that, and the other nine thousand dollars. Some of it was paid probably by insurance, and people maybe didn't have a secondary or whatnot and couldn't afford to pay, or some people passed away. I mean, various reasons. But these aren't because um, the insurances didn't pay. It's because our people didn't. Does that include workman's comp, Tina? Yes, it does. Okay. Do we have any sort of like sliding income based scale? No, we don't. No. Okay. Basically, if somebody calls me and they, they're um, a person that can't afford to pay, mm -hmm. I have them write me a letter saying they can't afford to pay, and then they become one of these write offs because it's been the policy of the select board not to uh, collect from people that can't afford it because we're afraid people won't call for our <coughs> services. And, I've actually had people say that before, that, well, I can't afford to, to call you, so I'm not going to, you know, I can't afford to pay. I said, it doesn't matter, and we want you to call. Okay. Do you have any data if it's up or down, just out of curiosity, from the last two years? Yeah, it, well, I don't know about 10 years, but no, last two. Year, oh, <laughs> if you look at your memo, you'll see that last year we wrote oh, off roughly 7% of the billed calls. 
which was 22,000. So the percentage of write-off has gone up, but also the percentage of calls have gone up. We've, yeah. We have 859 calls this past year, and before that was 748. So we're responding to a lot more calls. And do you have any idea how many are in Morrisville as opposed to out of town? I, I haven't run those figures okay. specifically. I'm just curious. Um, because we do pick up people from out of town, but I didn't I didn't run okay. the thing based on that. So okay. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we require any like proof of ineligibility to pay or inability no. to pay? It's just no. a letter. No, we okay. just ask them to write us a letter. Okay. Usually they're elderly people that and the elderly people tend to contact us more than, than people that are not elderly. So normally it's somebody on a fixed income that can't afford it or their wife passed away and they can't afford to pay her bill or whatever it was. So any other questions? No, I mean, it's an unfortunate cost of doing business. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the valuable service that uh, is provided, um, <coughs> you are going to have a certain percentage of people that are unable to pay. So I would make a motion to um, go ahead and approve the uh, total write off of this last fiscal year of $39,390.28. Can I have a motion or a second? I'll second. A motion, a second discussion. You have a question on uh, Zoom. Okay. Um, Kathy. Um, yes. Um, I realize that um, it's hard to pay our bills sometimes, but um, if I call Water and Light and tell them I can't afford my bill, I have to pay my bill. If I call you guys at tax time and say, I can't afford my bill, I have to pay my bill. So it's really hard for me to speak on this, but um, I think you need to have some policy. I think you need to have people show you that they can't afford that. You can't just say, I can't afford it and it's okay. So maybe next year we can work on a policy. Currently, when people call in with hardship paying, I encourage them to make a repayment plan first. I don't just say, oh, you can't afford it? Well, forget about it. Don't worry about it. But if they truly can't afford it, then all we have ever done is have them write a letter. If we are going to we, if we're going to have a policy in the future, somebody's going to have to be reviewing somebody else's financial statements and everything else, which is another added thing to do, which you know, I'm not sure that I have basically have the time to do that. I think that the um, policy for people, you know, on their honor system has been pretty good. We've never, I mean, even at 11%, it's well below the industry standard of writing off calls. So, um, you know, I'll just throw that out there. Do we have anybody who's taking <coughs> up on the repayment plan? Yes, we have. And we have people that do pay it. They really want to pay it. They say that. I just can't pay it all right now. I really want to pay and I say, pay what you can every month. And if they don't pay it that month, I send them a notice <coughs> saying you didn't pay. You said you were going to and you didn't. So, yes. you know, there is there is okay. policies in place, but they're not maybe written down like that. But that's just the practice that we've done. You want to be cognizant, too, of how much money you're spending in staff time versus the you know, well, and, and 30, that's 30, 40 thousand you're losing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Excuse me, but we're talking about bringing revenue into town, and now we're so easily just writing it off. It's forty thousand dollars. That that's half of somebody's pay. So um, I, I don't hear Tina saying this lightly that we're writing it off. That she has made a policy or practice of sending out, contacting them, and asking them to do a repayment plan and then asking them to put into writing that they cannot pay. I mean, it's something that the board can look at in the future. Yeah, we, we need a policy so everybody is treated equal, and that's what policies are for. So I do suggest that once things settle down, that maybe you could be working on a policy for that. Thank okay, you. thank you. Did you? Yeah. 
Just to remind people, even though I called on you, Kathy, please do identify yourself when you talk. So Tony, okay. Cody, Cody Hill. So I was a proponent of the EMS. I believe that's you, right? Yes, that's me. I told him you could go out and buy three ambulances, and I do, I approve. And I think you should. You should have the best equipment there is. But this is Morristown, and we need Morristown, Morristown homeowners need to pay for Morristown. So Tina, you need to break down who's getting what. If it's Johnson, to the to side park, if it's wherever the ambulance is going, we need to know who's not paying this. And I don't have a problem paying for Morristown people. I do have a problem paying for Elk Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm making an assumption here that we do bill other towns for the work that the no, REMS no. does? We do bill Elmore because Elmore is going to contract with us, and that price for Elmore's services is going up. We've already talked to the select board there, and it is going up. We do not bill other towns because it's considered mutual aid. When we go out and help in Johnson, it's because Johnson's uh, EMS crew is somewhere else. We don't just run to Johnson because we want to. We go there because we have to. And I would really hate to have to say to somebody, uh, excuse me, if you live in Johnson, we're not going to help you because you, we won't get all your money. I mean, I, I, I'm just, we, we run because we are an emergency squad that helps people, period. And, and, the and mutual, I assume there's some reciprocity there as yeah. well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it goes yes, both ways. Yes, they, right? they do. We when we need help, we get help. Everybody else helps us too. It's part of the mutual aid system. Yeah. If, if our if our ambulance goes to another municipality uh, on a mutual aid call and they transport a patient and that's kind of the key here they have to transport the patient mm -hmm. yeah. then we do bill that insurance company we don't, we don't not bill them because they're from not from Morrisville we, we bill insurances for every patient that uh, has insurance that we transport so uh, I'm not sure if that helps with clarifying that or not yeah, it's a little crazy I, I sat with Bill for quite a bit of time and uh, it's the, yeah. it's interesting that the the way it's set up that you get paid if you transport. Uh, there are lots of calls where they don't transport, uh, you know, for multiple reasons. So it's certainly something that's being looked at. But uh, again, we get as much back from other agencies. I mean, we see Newport's ambulance here, but. It's something we're always looking at. Right, Bill? <laughs> we just this year started billing for paramedic intercept requests from other municipalities. So if Harvard calls for paramedic intercept, it's a $250 charge because typically we don't transport that patient. So the billing <coughs> happens through Hardwick. Uh, so we send them a bill for the intercept for $250. And that's kind of a standard rate around the state. Okay. And Eric, they, they pay that 250 whether they collect that 250 is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Good. So I was in the Johnson Town offices two weeks ago, and they got better digs than you guys got. They got one hell of an office over there. Why can't Johnson come up with their own money to pay for this ambulance? We can go there and help people. Johnson should be taxing their people. Why should Morristown voters be taxing, I mean, paying for them? And the same with Elmore, the same with Hyde Park. They all have town offices and they, all, they can all have a million dollar kitty. We should not be paying for that. That should be a budget cut right there. Thank you. So we're not Johnson's primary EMS <coughs> service, correct? Where correct. We, correct. we merely provide mutual aid. I believe we're only the primary service for Morristown and Elmore. Is that correct? Yes. The, but, but the ambulance goes there, Travis. Yeah, I mean, the mutual aid is all dictated at the state level, is my understanding. There's a pretty complex district-based, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief. Yeah. Um, there's a pretty complex district-based system that sort of outlines yeah. mutual right. aid. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's let Bill speak, please. Bill's going to so, explain the structure. It's, okay, it's, so, yeah, it's um, a little more complicated. Bill, thank you, MS Chief. Um, so this write-off is a fairly standard across the EMS industry, whether you're a municipal-based, municipal-based, fire-based, private-based, everybody has write-off. Uh, 
the harsh reality of doing EMS, and you guys have heard me talk about the cost of response versus the cost of readiness. Uh, uh, and the cost of response is offset by insurance reimbursement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this number that we're talking about writing off, um, to me, represents uh, the uninsured, the underinsured, uh, the people who uh, uh, we are not simply taking people to health care for a number of these people, we actually are their health care. Um, they, they're not quite sure who to call, they don't have a primary care, they call us. And then uh, within about 10 minutes, two strangers show up and we try to make sense of it for them. That's one of the, one of the nobilities and the efforts of the things that we do in EMS. Um, so, uh, I th uh, and I understand, I understand the focus on the write-off. The flip side of this is that EMS offsets a, almost a full third of our budget every year. Uh, we have a roughly $800,000 operating budget for EMS. Uh, revenue that EMS brings into this town is roughly a third of that. Uh, so uh, we're talking about an 11% write-off uh, versus the other one third of our budget that we fully offset through insurance billing uh, and, and patient billing for revenue. Um, in regards to the mutual aid part, um, uh, Vermont is set up into 13 EMS districts. Uh, in this district, uh, we have a, a well-designed mutual aid matrix. Uh, so Memorial County Dispatch knows if Morristown is on a call and a second call comes in here, this is the ambulance we automatically dispatch to that. Conversely, if Northern EMS, which covers Hyde Park, Johnson, Belvedere, Eden, if they're on a call uh, and they don't have a crew readily available for a 911 call, there are portions of their area that come to us from each uh, That's all very reciprocal. Those patients that we transport from their area, we own the billing for that. We bill them as if it was one of our own patients. Um, uh, as Eric said, this is the first year we've started billing for paramedic intercept, uh, which is again been a kind of a standard in this district and standard across the state uh, of us uh, sending our paramedics out uh, to assist another crew. We 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 only half jokingly say when when people get scared they call 911 for the ambulance. When ambulance get scared they call us for a paramedic. Uh, and so we share that resource with our partner agencies within our EMS district. Uh, and we're just now starting to build for that. Uh, so we'll see how that offsets any, uh, any of that revenue going forward. Um, but let's not lose focus here that while we have a $39,000 write-off, which is standard in this industry to be somewhere between 10 and 15% of write-offs every year, um, EMS is still offsetting a full third of our budget to the tune of almost $300,000 a year. And you're, the, and you're the only service, uh, fire, police, and, and rescue, that does bring money into the, the town. Um, Revenues in, I should say. Right. There are, there are colleagues in public service. I, I tend not to think of it that way. Right. But of the three agencies, we are, we're, right. we're the revenue generator. Right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Okay, so did we get... We, we had a motion. motion. We have a motion. We have a motion. Okay, great. Okay, um, Tony. Um, we've already talked about this twice now. We're gonna we're gonna move on. We're we're gonna move on from this. Um, any any? We have a vote on this now. Yeah. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion is passed. Um, accept resignation of Highway Tech Three employee. Right. Okay. Call the director. Uh, Jeff Baker, he was a tech three. Um, he, his last day was last Thursday. Um, you have his resignation letter in your packet. I don't think so. Do we? see it in the packet. It yeah. wasn't in the packet, actually. Well, it just said that he was on. Yeah, yeah. We don't have that as an attachment. I thought it, it, I could attach it maybe if it didn't work well. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that. Um, his reasoning in his, and I can forward the letter to all of you, I apologize that um, I thought it was a uh, that he was uh, leaving, he actually um, went to Hyde Park, uh, the town of Hyde Park, 
He um, had no issues with the administration. He did not have any issues with his pay. He did not have any issues with his supervisor or his coworkers. His reasoning for leaving was um, the toxic environment that the town of Morristown is becoming. Um, Jack is a really outstanding, hardworking individual, and um, he just felt that um, the things that are happening in our community um, was just too much for him to to continue working on her. So I wished him well, we all wished him well, and uh, the door's always open if he wants to come back. <laughs> Thanks, James. That's why I love him. Thank you, Paul. It's, it's sorry to hear that. Very sorry to hear that. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's a uh, significant loss. We've, we've lost two now. I'm going to stand here for the next one. Okay. Well, the motion we accept Jeff Baker's resignation from the highway department. I'll second that. Any discussion? I'd like to put down what's regrets. Yes. Strong regrets. All those in favor? Judy, just aye. For, oh, aye. Yep, just for a second. Um, I, uh, I spoke with Jeff. Um, I've known uh, Jeff. Uh, for decades now, and, and uh, also uh, having to run into him up at the town garage here about a month ago, and had a long talk with him um, about uh, the fact that he worked here, I think, pretty close to 10 years at this point, and how much he enjoyed, uh, you know, the atmosphere of the, of the department, but, you know, um, he had serious reservations about, um, the affect of the community and its effect on the overall employees, but in particular um, what he was hearing on a pretty regular basis. And um, I had encouraged him to, you know, potentially uh, wait and see if things would change um, as we coalesce together to try to get a budget and, and move on as a community. Uh, and I did not have an opportunity to talk with him beyond that, but I think his resignation letter is my answer. And that's really unfortunate because he had great skills and he'd been doing this a long time. And I think that's a pretty seismic loss for the community. It is. He, um, I yeah. tried as well. Yeah. So, um, you yes. know, talking about pay and talking about atmosphere. You know, the garage was just a very toxic atmosphere. Um, I, you know, did a smile on the face on Sticky and said he should change his mind and, you know, yeah. I tried every, everything I could possibly do to even try to be funny with him, but he just, he, he made up his mind. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So anyways, that's all. So all those in favor of accepting the resignation? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion passed. And approve new hire for Highway Street Department. Uh, so Damien Hutchins, I think I'm saying the last name correctly, um, his first day was actually today. He was hired um, at a Tech One, and um, I think that the process or the, I think it's going to be at the highway garage, um, start there, um, and they're going to share him a little bit back and forth just to see where he fits um, the best. Um, he had the opportunity today to work um, start at the highway garage and then he was able to work with the street crew. Um, I met with him this afternoon to just do our orientation and uh, he seemed to be very much enjoyed what he was doing and he said that the crew was very welcoming and um, very supportive of him and felt like it was going to be um, a good thing so that was, was great to hear. And he currently has a CDL, is that correct? Yes, he, he has a classic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Tech, tech One is someone who comes to us maybe with a CDL license but has very little or limited uh, experience in uh, working on the road. Driving um, the plow truck, yes, or equipment. Um, so it's a, a great opportunity for the highway industry to um, create sort of a training um, because we have different staff now. The foreman um, positions have changed, so I think it'll be, it'll be a nice process for them to go through together, the three here, the two women, the and I don't know. I I apologize too because I I'm trying to I'm going to learn the software a little better because I thought that I had um, included it in um, an attachment of what his pay is. So I need that to be in motion. 
Nineteen what? Forty-six. Okay. So I'll have to sit with you, Judy. That's <laughs> what I think I'm doing it right. So. And it's hot. You said. H u t c h e n s. Okay. For I'll make the motion to approve uh, Damian Hutchins as a new hire for the highway department at nineteen dollars and forty-six cents. And out. And that's a tech one. It is. Yeah, so I would second that motion. Got a motion and a second. And uh, any discussion? <coughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Paula. You're welcome. Thanks, Paula. You're welcome. Yeah, I was just wondering how these techs are hired. Who hires them? Oh, well, let oh. Paula speak to that. Yeah. So we have a hiring process. Um, it's the same process throughout all of the departments. Um, when we have a vacancy, um, we do an internal advertisement. It's posted in all of the departments, um, allowing the internal um, employees the opportunity to move laterally if they so choose. And then it is advertised in our local paper, on our website, MD, um, Vermont local roads, depending on the position. And then I get the applications. Um, I go through them, I share them with whomever the department head is. We have a hiring committee. Hiring committee is usually myself, the town administrator, um, the supervisor, department head. Um, and depending on which department, there may be another employee that joins and we review the applications and we make a determination on who we're going to interview. We interview and then we as a group share our opinions, our thoughts, and we vote oh, on whether that person is going to be provided um, an offer of employment. And in addition, Paula, don't you do a background check in that, all of that, those other yes. processes? So, so I, and then after we do the, um, complete that process, then I, part of the orientation, um, and the offer of employment includes um, a, a background check. And we go through that process, and I have to do, um, if they're a CDL employee, I have to do a <coughs> license query, get their driving record, so there's steps that ha happen after. So they're hired with a condition that they pass all they the pass. different or if they're, um, in this case, you know, if someone's background has questionable, questionable um, activity, then we meet as an administration to decide whether, you know, the time frame, you know, were they 20 you know, years old and now they're 40, we're going to probably give them an opportunity to, you know, so it depends on what the situation is. Um, and in this case, um, we met with this individual and um, we felt like it was a good fit, um, even with the lack of experience. Um, I think that he is very eager to learn, and I think that he will be just fine. Um, but we also have a six-month pro probation period for that reason, you know, and it goes both ways. It may not be a good for, fit for him either. He's not going to know until he's in a position and is, you know, given the opportunity to see what the position in the work entails. So, um, yeah. And if we determine that he doesn't have the skill set, then we part ways at six months. It's, and it's very much made out that way um, during the hiring process. Good. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Paul. Oh, and just, um, and the, you know, we've got to think about our pool, too. Like, we are now starting to get um, qualified applicants in that have experience. Um, but just because, you know, someone may come with five years experience doesn't mean that they're going to be the better employee. Um, sometimes they have they're set in their ways, or um, there's someone that bounces around. So I think that the hiring committee does a really good job of working together to make sure that they're choosing the right candidate. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did, we, did we do a vote yet? No. Okay. You have, you have a motion, you have a second, we need a vote. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion has passed to hire Damian Hutchins. 
Number six, appoint a select board member to the Morrisville Development Fund. Currently, they are a four member board. Their fifth member by their bylaws is a member of the select board. And uh, we had a meeting this last week. As you know, we're in the process of transitioning them to an advisory board where the select board will now be the final decision maker on these uh, loan processes, but not before the, the uh, review of the documents has gone through a bank service uh, where they uh, will review all the documents to approve the loan and then send it back to the advisory committee. They will then vote. If it's a yes vote, then it will end up in front of you having been vetted by not only the bank, but by mm -hmm. still these business people here from the, the town. So you won't see proposals in front of you that will require a no vote. You will only see the yes votes. The no votes will stop at the committee. So we have to, I know. Uh, I, had, I had two members voice interest, uh, both Chris and Laura, had uh, shown an interest in serving on this board. So. Alrighty. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I was approached um, by Eric uh, when the position came open. Um, you know, I have obviously have 40 years worth of business experience and, and uh, felt that um, if I could be of some value to the board, um, I would certainly be willing to serve, but um, uh, certainly if Laura, you know, has strong feelings about wanting to serve on that board, she's been in the community longer than I have, um, and so I certainly would stand aside. I just uh, felt that it would be of uh, an interesting proposition and an opportunity to help incubate some new business in, in Morristown and be a part of that process. Uh, thank you. Um, I am very interested. Um, this is, as you say, incubating businesses. It's basically what I've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, as a starving artist, I have worked in almost every field that, in every business, so I have a unique sense of knowing the backgrounds and knowing all of the different businesses. Um, I was membership director for Stowe Area Association for five years where I worked uh, as the liaison, so how that vary, yeah. uh, working with um, all the businesses in Stowe at the time. Um, and then through my business, um, Black Diamond is someone I worked with and actually found him and brought him into the uh, Vermont Brewers Festival, which is a huge festival. Um, which became a cornerstone for him, which in turn helped him get his name out, get the money, and now, as you can see, he's opened a brick and mortar here, so I, I'm so proud of him having worked with him. I worked with him for quite a while. Uh, I worked with Green Mountain Distillers back when they were brewers. Um, for people that don't know, they were uh, brewed beer at the shed for years and years and years. Um, and work through the through Stowe area, uh, transitioning over to uh, Green Mountain Distillers, and then again thrilled that they're in town. Uh, <clears throat> very close working relationship with Lost Nation and Rock Art. Through the uh, the um, farmers market, that's one of the things that we push all the time is being incubators. And I work continually with new businesses. I'm currently working with uh, Two Acre farm, which is a lovely little farm across from Black Diamond, yeah. um, and working with her on what products to sell. Um, so this is a particular passion of mine that I happen to like, and I feel like I have long experience. I also have a, um, if I don't have a heart attack or something before, another two and a half years left to serve on this board. So I feel like that I have, uh, that's of value to have some consistency. So I would love to have it. I don't want to take it away from Chris, but it is something I'm very interested in. Well, certainly, you know, um, having heard, uh, you know, your past experience, uh, I think that you'd be a great asset uh, over to the, to the board. And um, I would certainly retract my uh, interest in, the, uh, in doing that. And I think that you'd be <coughs> valued and, and um, I would give you some, my support, certainly. Great. Thank you. So is, this, is that all you need, Eric? Uh, if you'd make a motion to appoint, and uh, I will send 
Laura an email with all the other four board members attached to it so she can make her connection clear. Okay. Yes. Well, I make a motion to appoint uh, Laura Streets as the uh, select board representative to uh, Morrisville Development Fund. I'll second. Okay, the motion and a second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion has passed. So congratulations, Thank Laura. You. I'm very excited. Discuss jointly appointed subordinate board's policy. So there's been a recommendation uh, for an adjustment or edit to the uh, current um, board policy there. Uh, it came through Travis uh, from a citizen. And Travis, if you want to speak more directly to it. Sure, yeah, I think the, the intent here is just to eliminate conflict of interest, <clears throat> particularly when it comes to boards such as the Development Review Board. Um, you know, there could certainly be a perceived or actual conflict. If a select board member were to actually um, you know, be making, making legally binding decisions as part of the DRB. Um, so, you know, this was proposed to me by a resident. I do support it. Um, there's been a few changes here um, to what was originally proposed. Um, but certainly open to any questions. So the change is what's in yellow here, correct? Correct. And that's, that's the only change? Yeah, I believe it previously stated something along the lines of, um, you know, somebody on the select board may not serve on any other town committee, um, which is, you know, we have that going on, Laura's on the housing committee, things of that nature. And I certainly don't see a conflict there. I think it's more so with some of these quasi-judicial um, committees where there could be a po potential problem. And I can speak to that. Having, I mean, I've, I've been a proponent of this for three years now. Because at one point we had a select board member who was also the chair of the DRB. Um, we had a, a chair of the trustee who was a um, member on the planning. Um, and it, it became um, concerning uh, when we were doing the town plan that there was lots of conflict of interest. Um, and the bigger, one of the bigger arguments that I was always uh, and still am pushing out is that it takes away a seat. If you have one person serving multiple seats, first of all, it's perception um, that they might be influencing. But second of all, they're taking a seat away from another town resident. And for me, having been served on all the boards, I think it's incredibly important to have as many different voices um, on these um, committees, uh, not committees, but uh, boards as possible. So this helps facilitate. And this was, I can s historically tell you that this happened years ago, Todd can speak to this, that there just weren't enough people willing to serve, so people were stepping into two, and I, um, I totally understand that, that that happened. I think now is, um, different that we have people who are willing to serve the process of recruiting people is very different um so i think this is a very timely um action and that we i would highly i su completely support and thank you for making it a formal recommendation i'll just jump in and say yeah i i have no trouble supporting this i've spoken about this a couple of times since i've been on the board yep so i can support it um, this would need to be voted by the trustees as well as change, correct? Correct. Anything you do with have my board's act to also take to the trustees as well. Have they voted on this or considered it yet? They wanted it to start. The <coughs> okay. Yeah, they have discussed it, right? But they wanted it to start here. They wanted it, yes. Yeah. It's been in, it's been in conversation for a couple of years. And <laughs> so I, I have one question on the policy. It really isn't sure. about the conflict of interest. Um, I found it, um, I guess, concerning that um, the clause in here that says if no village or town resident on the voter um, uh, on the voter checklist steps forward to serve within a month of a vacancy that the legislative bodies may appoint a non-town or non-village resident and i i take a little exception to that i i think about somebody who doesn't live within this community making decisions for this community objectionable and um, I would strongly question whether we want to leave that in there or not because I, I don't think it's appropriate. We, we, did, we, uh, we did discuss this a while ago. 
And when we left it in, one of the things is uh, state policy, state statute, whatever, allows that to happen. And it's, it, it is, it was left in because of, in the past, and it could happen in the future, that nobody from the community does step up to serve on the board. Then the boards are allowed to. And there have been people who have served on our boards who have businesses in our community. So they may not um, actually live here, but they are involved in our community. So this can go ahead. Well, I, I understand all that. Um, and I know that it's harder uh, these days to get people to um, commit to some of these boards. Um, and I think that you actually had a reduction in one of your um, committees from maybe seven members to five because you have a lack of interest in, in a particular board. I still find it puzzling to, I know that the state allows for this, but the municipality certainly could be more restrictive. And I guess just from a community-based piece, having somebody from Cambridge voting on, on municipal things that are happening within the community, I guess I just don't understand that. So I can yes. speak to that. Excuse me, Don. Sorry, we were, you should yeah, go you, first. Um, so I just want to say, this is a conversation that we had a year ago on this board. And at that time, the language was that there, there was no language at all about this. You know, you could be from, you didn't have to be from Morrisville at all. Um, and we did have several people that, I think it's fair to say at that time, we had one member of the Planning Council and one member of the DRB. That may, may or not still be true, I'm not sure, but um, that were non-Morristown residents. And again, we had a discussion about this, and the language that you're talking about, just to be clear, was a compromise language. That was kind of like, okay, so let's not go the full 10 yards to um, banning anybody from outside of town, but rather nobody in Morristown wants to step up, we'll let people from other towns uh, uh, serve on our boards. I frankly support exactly what you're saying. I, I agree. Um, I've said many times that Morrisville is not this small, sleepy town anymore. It's a big town, and it certainly has been an awful lot of interest in town, uh, political interest in getting on these boards, and I think that's great. And uh, I, I would support very much what you're saying. I, I, I am concerned about people from other towns <coughs> joining our boards and making, frankly, really important decisions. Right. The Planning Council has five members. To, to sort of within a town. So to think that uh, 20 or 40 percent of a board would be represented by non-Morristown residents is a little concerning. I know the DRB has nine members, is that correct? Seven? Seven full-time members, one member that's sort of within a town. Right, and so again, you know, that's a substantial voice from outside our, our town line. Right. My, understand, my understanding is, is that anybody who's currently in that position that may be out of town would be grandfathered in as far as this policy is concerned. Correct. But I guess, you know, moving forward, this yeah. will take place. I agree, Chris. I have, to, I have to add just one question. I know we were, I want to clarify this. The agenda item was about to discuss the appointed subordinate board's policy. So is the whole policy open for discussion or just the our, the yellow highlighted part? Yeah, right. The, the proposal is not highlighted, but the, the policy is on the table. Okay. I and just want to make, I'm just making sure it's clear. It might be, it's too long. I, I would suggest perhaps that if you're going to make more extensive changes than what's been brought to you tonight, it's that you. perhaps the the chair, you, you would reach out to the chair of the trustees to have a discussion about it ahead of time because this is a recent change. Yes. The language, that this other language, that, um, language? that took some time to get through. Yes. To, to ensure some success in, in a new edit, this recent, this soon after the last one. Yeah. I mean, the language that you're discussing tonight, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's any pushback from the trustees on that or not. I have no idea, but so, to add more language to that is may add more. To clarify, the trustees have always been supportive of town residents only. The select board has been the one, the board that's been accommodating to non-town residents. So if the select board is reversing course on this. It makes the policy much simpler. I can X up that sentence right now. Okay. I mean, I'll say I certainly agree with Chris and Don on that aspect. Sorry, Laura. Go ahead. Having served on both the planning and the DRB, um, 
I am the devil's advocate here because I've served on both. And I can tell you, first of all, the planning council, the planning council does not make decisions. They make recommendations. So everybody keeps saying they're going to make decisions. They are not making decisions. They are making recommendations. The, the time this, at the time this happened, um, there were uh, two uh, planning and there were two DRB people. One lived in Hyde Park. One lived in Elmore, which we share a school with. Ultimately, um, they had businesses here, were prominent business people, um, and I will say that how it was handled um, highly offended everyone, and there was some, the select board reconsidered because had it gone through as they originally proposed, we were going to have, uh, we were going to lose a lot of people. Now, that being said, the ultimate way that this works and why it has never been that much of a problem is that anybody who applies must go through um, the select board elected and the trustees. It is up to the trustees and the select board to have the discipline to say, if someone comes through from Cambridge, to say, no, we do not think you're appropriate. And I think we have been elected to do that and I think we can have some rational judgments and I, I can say um, this is now out in the business world that business owners uh, <clears throat> if you have a prominent business here that your voice is not important and that's what came out of this whole thing um, so I, I would say we don't change it because ultimately again we're in the power. So if a very prominent business person comes up, um, they they can't run for select board. They could possibly be D, uh, DRB, but it's up to us to say, no, I don't think it's appropriate. And I, I think that's what we were elected to do and we should do. And I just don't think we should cut off our noses to spite our face or offend business owners any further. And I, that's my feeling. <laughs> Tell us who you are. James Brewster. Um, I, just one thing, given given what Laura is, is describing here, so you have somebody from Cambridge you know, on the board because there at the time isn't anybody else that is looking to do it. Another year goes by, there is somebody from town who is interested in doing it. As my feeling goes, once you're on these boards, you're on these boards for life until you don't want to do it anymore. You guys aren't in the business of kicking people off and never seen it happen. I don't think you're going to go through and say, you know what, you're just not any good anymore. It just doesn't happen. So, you know, really, what you should do is say, well, Mr. and Mrs. Cambridge, we've got somebody from Morristown now that would like to do it. Thank you for your years of service. And replace that person with somebody from Morristown. That person from Cambridge should probably have the understanding that they may not be here for life until such a time. And I would on, ask on, on top of that, just to also play devil's advocate for, for Laura, where she said, you know, planning council members don't make decisions, they only make recommendations. recommendations. Thank you. You know, uh, however you feel about the sidewalk issue, that sidewalk issue was pushed and was the pet project of a planning council member who doesn't pay taxes in this town. You know, so I understand what you're saying. That's just laying it out there, regardless of how you feel about the, the, the sidewalk piece. So. Thank you, Jamie. I, I did jot something down. I guess the only thing I would say is they don't make it a voting decision. Right. But the fact that they're making recommendations, those are decisions. The planning council, I remember quite clearly last fall, they are the ones who tell, tell us or let us know what changes are going to happen with zoning in particular. It starts with them. Those are pretty powerful and strong decisions. Those aren't, those aren't simply recommendations. They are recommendations, I agree. They can't vote them in. Only we and the village trustees can vote them in. But it starts with them. That's where the process starts. And I think that's a pretty important decision. I, I would still but call it that. He, there are five members on that board. So he had the support of four other members. He just happened to be outspoken, and it was a cat. But it could not have gone forward without the other four members. So he's not, he, he cannot act alone. So 
as an outsider, he put forward something that was popular because it had the support of the, or at least a quorum. So that's the whole democratic uh, democratic process that works, and why um, you know. And again, I would like to know: Have we ever had anybody from Cambridge? I mean, the chances are. No, ma'am. And I just again, the you know, I think the chances are so slim. And again, it's you know, it's people from um, Elmore or Hyde Park, and I do think we had a walk up. But again, we share their kids go to our school, so they have a vested interest in this town. Um, so it's not like there's some, you know, uh, staff member from Marshalls who lives in, you know, New York that's trying to come in. So I'm just saying, let's keep keep our door, keep our oh, keep the doors open. Don't restrict ourselves so much that then we then have regret that we've made a, a decision. Because right now we still have uh, because of the people that were grandfathered, we have one on DRB and one on planning, and one on planning which is Josh, who's the sidewalk. The yeah, so I, I'm just saying it's, if we get too restrictive, it, we just really, um, we, it, that puts out bad vibes and I think it, it's not good. That's so, my thought. So if I may, um, what the language just says is, is that a non-resident of the town or village can fill this vacancy. It doesn't talk about business people. It doesn't speak to, you know, Joe Smith or Sally Smith. It just is open season for anybody who would get onto this board from out of town. And I just, it, I just, just from a, uh, you know, a community aspect, um, I think that decisions should be made locally and by residents of the community. And um, I hear what you're saying, Laura, but to be honest with you, I'm not convinced that that's the best move. Well, Could I can certainly say as a select board person, I would never vote for someone to be on the board who didn't have a vested interest in this town. And I would hope that, that um, you have enough judgment between all of us and the trustees. I don't know that anybody would. So I see what you're saying about refining the language that to make it uh, clear so that we're not filtering through people. Could we clarify taxpayer versus resident to include I mean, business I, I owners who are right not there. residents? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has on here that the village or town resident on the voter checklist. So that. Yeah, I'm talking about that. <coughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't. Right. So that I, doesn't make any I guess. Sense. I guess if 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 we're thinking that we would like to make. An, a, an amendment or, or change in this policy, um, I would prefer, prefer to, to reach out to the trustees and say, this is kind of where we're, what we're looking at, <coughs> and get a consensus between the two boards. Um, yeah. And if there's some compelling reason coming from the trustees to change my mind on this, or anybody else's, then we would have that conversation, whether Judy is the liaison with the president of the trustees, um, and then come back for a revisit of this, um, I think would make sense. Yeah. Well, Todd, you'd spoken to that. Go ahead. I was going to just pass out. I, these are Tom's changes in yellow. Uh, this, is, this is my creature. I wrote this originally to help reappointments happen on my boards because it was being handled inconsistently. And if we're going to update Tom's uh, language, which you seem to support, which is fine, the one thing that this has in addition, other than taking the word out subordinate, and number 14 at the end, it has an updated, uh, here, Tom, you know, Tom, Tom, put your proposals. He proposes to be tracks. So if you're going to accept Tom's proposals for a change, I would like to also have you change number 14. So when I wrote this policy for the for how joint procedures work, sorry, when I wrote this policy yeah. on joint procedures work, the select board and trustees have not adopted a conflict of interest policy yet. Both boards have adopted basically the GLCT version of that. So I think this document, if you're going to update it, should reflect that. That language change does that. So I if you're going to adopt Tom's language, I would ask you to uh, adopt the whole thing. I've, I've taken out. Laura's impassioned plea of plot aside, 
I'm taking up the one sentence in pen right there that the four of you seem to agree with. Right, and I'm not I'm not proposing that we make a motion on this tonight. Okay. Yeah. Um, that you know we would um, commiserate with the village trustees and a potential proposed change. I'm happy to do that, Chris. I'm the one person here who works to the town of the village, so I can attend the next trustee meeting. Like. So maybe Judy and Tom Snip. Is Tom Snip still the chair? The trustees? I believe yes. so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And Carla is right now, isn't he? No. He Tom was just elected, wasn't he? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I would say Judy Bickford and Tom Smith and yourself, Todd, maybe you could sit down and just talk about this sure. or bring it back. So what do you want us to talk about? So I've heard about three different things here. So are we are we good with those three changes? So you're talking number about 14. number four and number 14? Correct. Right. Number four and number 14, these are two big changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about the trustees and the tricky language with the pen, the third change here that you all spoke to about the residency and the non-residency issue. And from a previous, I've uh, kicked this uh, around with the trustees quite a few times and you, the trustees will be supportive of that. Yeah, they, they've certain. been wanting this for years. They've been wanting this for a long time. So the change in yellow, the strike out on the, 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 the change in yellow on number four, the strike out on number four, and then number fourteen. The suggested changes in number fourteen. So yes, yeah. consistent with the other policy. But I will say you could do must be from you know within fifty miles and have a vested interest in town, and that would solve the problem. And because you know knowing the knowing where it's coming from, it's preventing any voices having any kind of say so in Morrisville power and light which if you have a huge business, and for those of you who might know what I'm referencing, there were some big issues, and um, this was one way to get a large voice out of that. And that's why I'm very opposed to it. I mean, would, would taxpayer cover vested interest if they, if they own property, if they own a business, they're a taxpayer of the town. We, we could prefer residents to begin with, and if no resident steps up with a month, consider non-resident taxpayers, if that's viable language. Well, and if their well, kids are in school and <coughs> have part of the conversation that yeah. Judy and Tom and Tom have. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need a motion for... No. no this, is up for, this is up for discussion this evening. Okay. 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 All right. Is that good with you, Judy? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Of course you mean. Thank you. Okay. I'll schedule something with, with Scott. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you. I just want to say I agree with Chris. I think you should be from Morristown. The same with the EMS. You should be from Morristown, Morristown, Morristown. We are the taxpayers. We pay, and, and, and it's all, it all should be Morristown. That's it. If you got a vacant seat, you got a vacant seat. Don, if you're not there tonight, that seat is empty. There's nothing wrong with an empty seat until we get somebody to fill your seat. Everybody should be from Morristown, period. Thanks, Tony. Okay, number eight, review Morristown Road Policy. Is that you, Todd? Uh, that is me again, so very quickly. Just do reintroduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hold on one second. I'm just going to pass these up. Thank you. I don't think we have that. Thanks. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question to circle back on what you guys just mentioned? Christy Smith. So is this part of the conflict of interest policy or is this a totally separate policy? Separate policy that references separate the conflict policy. of interest policy. And does it is it very specific on exactly what boards, you know, you can serve on, like more can be on the select board and on the, the head of the uh, farmer's market, is it very specific about that? It speaks about jointly appointed boards, so only those boards appointed by both the select board and the trustees, which would be the DRB, would be the planning commission. That'd be the two. So just the two. Yeah. Okay. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually agree with Tony, and I would rather have more town members on our boards, and I would rather have to have people serving on multiple boards and our decision making in our community. Christine, do you, do you want a copy of that just to take a look at? Sure. I get an extra. Thank you. It's highlighted for your interest. <laughs> okay. So thank you, guys. Todd Thomas again, planning director, uh, planning director, zoning administrator, health officer, all sorts of things. 
So uh, I wanted to make sure we start this conversation before Eric left. Uh, as we go as a normal town administration, uh, we see policy issues and that doesn't make sense. We try to make changes and draft changes as we go. So the last couple of years with Eric and Kevin, uh, they've shown changes of what we'd like to do to the road policy. And I really didn't want to dump a new road policy and two years of changes on a new town administrator or town manager's desk when he gets here and he's a whole other other issues that are potentially uh, more uh, pressing to deal with. But these are really impactful decisions. Uh, so I wanted to make sure we started this process, introduce the board to the policy and the changes, and, uh, and go through them real quickly. There are five main changes here. Uh, the proposed changes reduces the minimum cobble sack size from 100 feet to 70 feet. No, wait, um, wait. Where are you? Uh, I was going to give you some overall, oh, overall thing here. And then go back? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so quickly reduces minimum cobble sack size from 100 feet to 70 feet. Uh, you really only need 100 foot if you get the big ladder truck there, not every call us into the ladder truck, so it gives us flexibility. Uh, this returns the urban road cross section, I think the village and the north end commercial district to the long held standard. Uh, it's, this specifies how to measure minimum width of private roads. Right now that specificity is not there. It's from edge of the uh, edge of the um, ditch to edge of ditch. Uh, upgrades the minimum culvert size from 15 inches to 24 inches for town roads, 15 inches for private roads. And that goes along with the uh, Lake Champlain cleanup uh, language. They want 18 inch culverts. Uh, and this deletes out the old curb cutter, one curb cutter property limitation that Roland Boom and the town road former used to have. We now allow multiple curb cuts. If someone wants a U shaped driveway to have the land for it, we allow it. This policy mm -hmm. doesn't allow that, even though we've been allowing it recently because of her. Uh, employees have changed. The one thing the select board needs to change needs to consider on here. So, those changes aside, this policy used to have a prohibition on dead end roads. The select board suspended that. That uh, dead end road policy, where we don't take dead end roads because we don't serve a public purpose. If you have a dead end road, Travis, you're not going to take that road to get from point A to point B. No people will take that dead end road, even if it's a town road, people will live on that road. So the old policy basically said a road has to have a public service, a public purpose. You have to be able to go somewhere other than the private homeowner on the road. So uh, that was suspended maybe six years ago now, five years ago. So we've got a policy in effect for suspension for dead end roads, which we allowed for Menashe on Jersey Way Part 2. Uh, that project's being built right now. At some point, we need to make a decision. Are we going to change the policy and start to allow dead end roads, which are more time consuming to clear snow from, turn around in, or are we going to uh, return to the old policy, suspension aside, that project is now under construction, and only take in town roads that are, in fact, provide a public purpose. So uh, in the past, there hasn't been like a, a minimum number of residents on a road to be taken up by the, or proposed yes. for the town to take over yes. um, to be considered? That's what you're doing right now. So it used to be no dead end roads. It had to be a through road to be considered. Since you suspended that, the town has been using five houses and a thousand feet minimum for the spec. So minimum five houses, minimum a thousand feet of length. Uh, that's what you're using in the interim to do with the suspended policy. And if you're going to change the policy, change the policy, don't just suspend it. Change the policy so we can get clear direction applicants and, and developers. That makes sense. So that's a decision you can make. Do you want to keep with the allowing dead end roads or go back to the we only allow, we only take over through roads? So right now, if we did change it and not take over dead end roads, the dead end roads that we took over are all grandfathered in. Yes, um, you can obviously, the select board can, uh, can throw up a road at any time, but the roads in theory, that would be a whole separate conversation moving roads that you've taken, but there are more roads coming on that are dead end roads that they're going to meet your policy, suspended policy right now that you'll have to take over if you so choose to to meet your policy. And there's no, ch there's no legal problem with us changing this policy and kind of discriminating against people coming up? No, it is your policy. Okay. So Todd, um, are there specific road standards? So if somebody has built a private road and now petitions the town to take it over, are there specific criteria in place that says that it's up to a specific standard for us to consider? I just passed out the standard right there for our urban roads. So the second document right there, that's a cross section. Right okay. Yeah, right. yeah, okay. So that was our old cross section before we suspended the road width for our urban roads. I was kind of done off the hip at the select board meeting one night. I was not in attendance. Uh, that policy, that change, that one meeting change, has had a long-standing impact in our town. 
The road, as you can see, their minimum width for a village road used to be nine foot minimum. It's a minimum, it doesn't have to be nine feet. The select board can say if we want a town road, it's gotta be 12 feet on that village road. It depends, does it serve six houses? Does it serve 34 condos? What does that village road serve? So the old policy had some flexibility. The select board changed to 12 foot minimum. So all the new developments in town are being designed with 12 foot minimum roads so the town can take them over. That is more stormwater. That is more paving. That is more sanding. This is real money you're spending here for a road with a one size 12 foot fits all, which isn't really what I would recommend. And I would encourage anybody that you can come look at my road. We were built um, to 18 and they started plowing to 24 and my road is in serious trouble because plowing to 24, they have now pushed all that gravel into the ditches and we no longer have ditches the entire length. Um, and I personally, my property is being really destroyed from water and I've spoken with Kevin to address it, but this all came as a result of going from 18 to 24. So it's a, so now it's a highway. We've had huge speeding problems now because it's a highway. You know, we're dead end road, and because it's so wide, we're, we're just smaller. Um, they had to slow down, and it's been disastrous for my neighborhood. People drive faster on wider roads. It's a yeah. simple it's disaster in my neighborhood. So I'm not asking for a motion tonight. I'm asking to start this conversation. I just wanted to start this conversation again with Eric, who's still here. Uh, Kevin's been part of this. I've done exchanges with Kevin. This is a policy that's written by me with the highway superintendent and the, town, the previous town administrator. Happy to change it, but I wanted to make sure we captured this town administration changes, some of the changes I'm recommending, uh, at least started the conversation before we have a whole new administration and they're not bigger fish to fry. And this is an important policy. This is long-standing impacts, mm -hmm. but it's not mm -hmm. immediate. So I want to make sure we start this discussion and see where it goes in the next meeting or two. It's got to have a huge impact on how much uh, sand and gravel that we're putting on these roads, that extra. Uh, yeah, one size fits all for a village roads doesn't make sense 12 foot minimum. It really doesn't, especially the town's going to take them over. I mean, if you drive into Brooklyn Heights, that's an eight foot wide traffic on both sides. And people drive slow, it's an hour road, and it's it's fine. The fire truck has an issue getting in there, and it's a small little development. I mean, that's not appropriate for the connector road from Center Road to Route 15 behind uh, the credit union. That's where this conversation started. The select board made a quick decision to say, whoa, we don't want a nine foot road there. It was always near policy, but requirement within the nine foot road. If you say you want 11 foot travel lanes there and 22 feet of pay of travel lane width, fine. But that's was always included in the policy. I think that was missing when that quick decision was made. So I'm happy to answer any questions, have to discuss this at the upcoming agenda. Are you saying that this needs to be changed too? That's the old one. Right now it just says 12 feet. Okay. One size fits all, 12 foot from the Yeah. 12 foot's interstate Yeah. All right. So, but. So you're suggesting that, that, that policy, yes. you ju you're I suggesting this needs to be changed too. Yes. Okay. And that those changes are reflected in the edits in the document itself. Okay. These edits go back to that cross section, our previous long-standing cross section. All right. Yeah. I, I'd love to sit down and run through this with Kevin too. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, do we need to have a formal add it to an agenda, make it an official agenda discussion here? Yeah. If you want to add your next agenda when you have time. And have Kevin and myself here. And if you want to, Chris, if you want to look it over with staff in the daytime when you're here, I'm happy to do it. Let us know. Yeah. Okay. Kevin's, Kevin's concerns related to a more narrow road are going to be related to the winter snow plow. Yep. Wings, plows, you get some width. When you start narrowing up your roads, now you're taking up three quarters of the road, you meet traffic, it becomes a nightmare. So, anyway, there's, there's a lot to be considered here. A lot of discussion to be had before you make a, a change in it. But uh, it is it is time to, to look at this policy and um, the stormwater has been a pet peeve of mine uh, when we have developments being brought on board and they're being built to spec so that we can take them over. There's stormwater involved and you know that's, those roads are typically developments that service the development. Mm -hmm. But the permit fees annually to the state of Vermont are you know, when you take over the road, take over stormwater, you take over the fees responsibility as well. So annual fees. annual fees. So it's the taxpayers are paying for developments stormwater fees. I don't, I don't agree with that, and uh, that's part of the change in this policy. Yeah, number, number six emphasizes the town shall not be responsible for maintaining the storm, road stormwater system or absorbing the cost of any associated state stormwater fees. Those fees aren't just cheaper; they're state fees. They'll go up. What, so, what your policy is basically doing is saying, if you're going to create a development, you're going to create an HOA. 
Right. I was going to we say have just that. run into a problem, and not just we we've run into a problem at this point in Jersey Way. There's no HOA involved. A large number of houses, and it's been identified as a three-acre impervious surface site. The state is saying we have to put in a filtration system. We own the roads and sidewalks. We're one-third property owners of the impervious surface. The property owners themselves cover two-thirds. No one out there is interested in forming an HOA without that nonprofit HOA in place, we can't be receivers of the grant money, which is $360,000. And that money is probably going to go back to the state of Vermont because it's got to be used. It's ARPA money, so it has to be used by or earmarked by the 24, uh, December 31st, 24. Um, and we have done, Tyler and I have worked extensively on this. The plans that were drawn up by um, a for-profit company that takes these three-acre impervious identified sites around the state and they did they draw up designs for filtration now we've just put one in last year over in the municipal parking lot it was great uh didn't cost our taxpayers any money to put that filtration system in the ground because it was paid for through arpa funds however jersey way the stormwater pipes are about 18 feet in the ground and there's surface water within six feet of the surface so there's no way to put a filtration that they designed and said would fit there. It doesn't work. So we're stuck. Being one-third responsible owners of the impervious surface out there in a, uh, in a development and not getting cooperation from the two-thirds owners, which are the residents out there. So the grant money is going to go away. The state's still going to be breathing at us saying you need to put in a filtration system of some sort. And I've pushed back and said you need to change your rules. You've given us an impossible scenario. And you're pitting our taxpayers against our local government on a state rule. So the state needs to reevaluate this. How are these, um, like three acres, identified? Who identifies them? The state. And how do they do that? Just at a DEC uses a map by the, the uh, rooftop roads, yeah. any perfect surface, projects. The footprint of your house, 20 by 40. That's if my math's right. That's 800 square feet. Impervious surface. So each building has a dimension, and they, they calculate that along with roads, whether it's paved or gravel, it's an impervious surface because it's packed. So, yeah, so they, they count all of that. So we've had, there were several sites that identified here in town. The high school is one of them. So there's a filtration uh, project underneath the dog park that covers the stormwater coming out of there. The one in the municipal parking lot covers a tremendous amount of stormwater from here in the village. Um, there are other private entities that have had to do the same thing uh, in the north end of town. So we have swirl separators that we clean out every year. But uh, yeah, this is, it's a big deal with the state and you want to be in compliance, but Jersey Way is one of the developments around the state that just doesn't work. And Because uh, they don't have an HOA. They don't have an HOA to work with in order to be receivers of yeah. the grant money. And the, the, the lines themselves are so deep in the ground from there. That, that was built 40 years ago. Yeah. This rule just came into play in the last 10. So, you know, they're, they're, they're going backwards with this stuff and it's, it's just created a hardship here. So it, rather than the, the local government going after its own taxpayers because of a state imposed restriction, I, I think the state needs to re-examine this. We're not the only town yeah. in the state with this problem. There are several other communities that have the very exact same problem. No HOAs, nobody to, to, to join in. So. And there's no grandfather class. No. Oh, no. no the, right? the three acres was the grandfather. It was it was a reduction from what their actual acreage is there. The new development going forward is larger than that. This is a this is what they grandfathered was giving at three acres. So it reduced the amount of places they identified. Uh, Yahoo. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to make sure our, us taxpayers are not paying for developer stormwater fees, which we're not, but we want to emphasize this in there, if we're not paying for uh, pavement, we don't need a pond, we don't need sandy, we don't need a, overly wide roads, if we're not doing overly sized cul-de-sacs, we want to make sure our culverts are the right size and minimum size, and this is a policy worth looking at. And, and do you have a time frame for this? Two years ago. <laughs> uh, if you want it, it's up to you, it's up to your bandwidth. If you're the bandwidth, I'll be at your next meeting. We'll discuss it again, answer questions. And if uh, Chris has shown interest, Chris wants to come in one day and meet myself and Kevin and Eric or whoever's after Eric and talk about this, happy to help. 
I just like to see it not languish and okay, so us not sit here with a policy of suspensions that are four years. <coughs> Within the next month would be a good idea. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Next on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Uh, so tell us, tell us who you are first. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Bob Borkry. Um, I would agree with Eric and Sly. Given the rough ride that we've recently had with the budget, to not adhere to what they're talking about, I think is foolish. I think you know. I think many people in town, most people in town, are feeling that we are supporting the development uh, as taxpayers. And I think that's a large part of why the budget failed. I really do. Uh, many, many people that I've talked with have said that to me. And so I would, I would agree wholeheartedly with both Todd and Eric's uh, uh, sentiments about going forward <coughs> with the is this plan and then reducing the uh yield on the tax rate. I don't think you need to be taking on more of it. You need to be taking on less. Thank you. Thank you. To to Bob's point, Todd Thomas again, one point I can clarify, if you don't go back and restore and, and keep accepting dead end roads, eventually we're gonna need another employee for plowing at some point in the future. And it's really those roads, those dead end roads, they're they're a nice private resource. Mm. People can get home to them, but they don't serve a public purpose, and that's where you have to kind of draw the line somewhere. What is the public plow? What should be plowed? Roads that serve a public purpose, not roads that serve a private purpose. That's my own take, and that's what I've done in other towns as well. So if we don't, if we keep the suspension alive, eventually it's going to be it's going to work for the road crew, and eventually, as these dead end roads add up, and there are a couple in the pipeline right now, uh, you'll eventually need an employee down a few years down the line. If there are some in the pipeline right now, are we um, going to? be proactive enough by dealing with this next month? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the uh, normally people apply for roads come usually fall when they're thinking about their plowing bills. If you get this done this, uh, this summer, okay. you'll be well ahead of them. But yeah, there is a race to the finish line. If they apply before you change the policy, then they are grandfathered. Shh, don't tell anybody. Okay, well, everyone's looking at <laughs> 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 All right, letter to support the LF CUD 2023 construction grant application. So this is the Lamont Fiber Net Communications Union District. Uh, Jane Campbell's on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And they're asking for a letter of support uh, from you to uh, continue to expand. My understanding. Uh, they're doing a grant application. They're just they're seeking more funding in order to continue to, to, to spread the broadband out in more rural areas. Eric, is there uh, is there any matching funds um, as part of this application? The they do have not requested funds from us as a matter of this. No, this is simply a letter supporting their application for a grant. Okay. As many grants look for those, but no, they have not. Uh, they they've hinted at. No, I just they would like some of our money, but part of the application, the grant application, wasn't mm -hmm. tied to any matching funds. That was my question. Oh, that I don't know. I okay. haven't seen the grant application. And Jane's on. Oh, Jane's on. Yeah. So Jane, do you want to address yeah. that? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, no, this is the grant that uh, there were federal funds that came to the state, and the state allocated a certain amount to each CUD based on the number of addresses that have no or substandard internet service. Um, so it's about 13 million that was allocated to us um, because we now are in negotiations with a partner to build, operate, and maintain our fiber network. We're, we're just about ready to go for that grant and ask for the 13 million for construction funds. Um, so far we have an memorandum of understanding with our potential partner we're finalizing negotiation details as we speak um, but this would just be a letter of support for saying yes we we would like the cud to get the funds that were allocated to them as you know a number of lamoille county towns um, pledged a certain amount of arpa funds that did have a match that that might be the confusion around the match um, but morristown elmore it was too late for uh 
our ARPA funds. So we're asking. We lost you, Jane. In those two towns to uh, put in letters of support just to make it clear that it's fiber network. Any other questions? That answers my question. Okay. Thank you. Travis? I'm good. I had the same question as Chris. But okay. I think that was the confusion because I remember a meeting a couple of months ago where we talked about the ARPA funds. Yeah. Correct, yeah. yeah. They were looking for money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would make a motion to um, give the uh, select board support to the uh, construction grant application for LFCD. Okay, I have a motion. I need a second. I will second. A motion and a second for a letter of support for the CUD and... Um, would that also include allowing the chair to sign on behalf of the board because that's the way the letter is written? Okay. I would certainly okay. amend my uh, motion to include a signature by the chair. And I will uh, amend my second. <laughs> All right. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. And motion is passed. All right. Discuss closing forest land funds. So as you know, the Brian Palm parking lot project has been completed and we're looking to pay the bill uh, for that. Uh, Tina can speak more specifically to this, but there was uh, logging done on the town forest a number of years ago and the proceeds from that logging operation were put into this fund. And it's been sitting there for some time now. Uh, and this project was one that the Conservation Commission uh, generated. They started, they ran it to ground, they worked at the state because the parking lot is on state property but uh, they uh, got their permissions and everything in, in place and this is where they would like this money to be applied to so in order to do that the board because it is an official fund the board needs to vote to close the fund which will allow that money to be transferred in their operating account and allow teams to write a check for the for the bill did i get that right tina I'll make a motion just to generate discussion, if nothing else, but I move to close the Forest Lands Funds account and deposit the funds into the Conservation Commission mm -hmm. Fund. The approximate amount is $20,140.49. I would second that to move to discussion. Discussion? So I, I'm new to this, to this fund. Um, so could you give me a little back, more background in terms of, you said there was logging done and that money was, uh, this fund was generated from that? That's correct. Okay, and there was never a purpose allocated to that fund other than it just became money into the town? Correct. So um, for no other better use, um, doing the uh, parking lot seemed to be the best use of this. That's what they felt, yes. Yeah. And who ultimately controls this fund, is it? You do. Okay, but it wasn't through the Conservation Commission or anything else. It, it, it wasn't, the Conservation Commission didn't create this, it all came through the select board to, to create this fund. Well, the, the, the Conservation Commission oversees our forest lands. Right. So when they logged it, they were, it was their project, so to speak. Right. So the money was put into this fund, um, and, and I don't, Tina, just help me with, uh, I'm assuming that the funds were just assumed to be Conservation Commission funds as a result of how they were generated. Is that correct? Well, I think the Conservation Commission assumes that they're extra funds for them, but that's not how the fund was originally set up. It was set up by the select board to be utilized in the future, but there was never anything said. It's definitely conservation or whatever. It was just money that was generated from doing the logging on the town forest land. Um, yeah, I just wanted some background on it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have an issue with it at all. I just mm -hmm. wanted to know what I was voting on. So a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion has passed. <clears throat> on to old business. Hiring procedure for town administrator. Do you want me to take it or do you want to? I'm going to let you take it, Travis. <laughs> okay. Um, Paula, HR Director. So Travis, Travis and I worked on this together. He um, sort of created it. I made some adjustments. Um, and my only 
thoughts that I would like to share is just I think the majority of the hiring, it's just a procedure, so I don't even know if we necessarily need a vote on this. Um, I think it's just to get um, a consensus on how we're going to move forward more work through the process. But my only um, feedback is just wanting um, to share the essay question in the video, just um, you know, making decisions on whether we're going to do that um, so that we can let individuals, when we're um, um, scheduling them, know ahead of time what the expectation is. I don't know, in my opinion, if the essay is really going to give us what we need. Um, I think anyone can write, they can Google, they can write. GPT. I mean, exactly. So I'm not <laughs> sure that I support that, that process. Um, just my feedback for whatever it's worth. Um, you may be able to learn a lot from the individual, but until that individual is in the seat and doing the work, anything on paper or anything that you learn about the in individual in an interview, someone can interview really, really poorly and be incredible. And vice versa. So that's my feedback. Yeah, I'll add with the with the essay question. I think a key aspect of that is asking them to speak to their essay at the first interview. Certainly, the paper can be fudged, but I think once you make them actively speak to that, you're going to get a bit more of a genuine feel. Um, sort of my thought process on that one. And my thought too was that they wouldn't get the question ahead of time. Yeah, it might be something given to them. Like at the end, we'll have like three or four people we're interviewing at one time, so they're giving it to them and then review it somehow. I don't, I don't have it in my head. Paul, I had thought about that. It is yeah. in the public packet now, so if we choose to use, so it'd have to yeah, be something. If, if we choose to use the questions that I've put here, they are out there. We would need to change the questions yeah. if that's what we want yeah. to do. I just would like to see um, just an impromptu, just respond to a, a maybe an email or something. How would you respond to this email or just? Get, get an idea if the person can write. But we also have a pro probationary period that we're hiring someone, so we can find out at that time, too. So it's not, uh, it's not something I'm going to sort of dying on, no. So I, I'll play the devil's advocate on this. Um, you know, I, I, at first, uh, when I looked at the essay piece, um, I said, you know, that, that would be a pretty easy thing for somebody to, you know, do some background and then come up with some language it would uh, pacify most of the people around here. Um, but if you ask this in an interview question, it puts people on the spot. The other, uh, but uh, on the contrary to that, um, it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, unless you have some, you know, basically some historical knowledge of what's going on in our community. Um, you could answer it pretty broad based, but, you know, um, it would be, I guess I would like to see not only how they would respond to that essay question, but also it would give you some insight on their writing skills Correct. in their thought process. And I think that's the advantage that I see in the essay piece is, you know, how thoroughly did they vet this question, mm -hmm. uh, what their writing skills really look like, and maybe how their approach is. And I think that that would be hard to capture if you just simply ask them that question in an interview. I, I agree. I, and I think the questions proposed here are, are pretty specific and somewhat unique to Morristown. They're, you know, the answers are going to differ for Morristown than they would for any other community if you were to ask the questions. Um, and I think asking them to speak and elaborate to it in the interview, you're going you're gonna to really get a feel for did they do their research, do they understand the community, um, or did they just Google you know, how do I answer this? Did they type yeah, it in chat, GPT, whatever it may be? You're really good at marketing. <laughs> and that should come out. When we when we do interview them, mm -hmm. we will have read these essays. You know, we'll get a pretty good sense yeah. of uh, how much of this they yeah. wrote and thought about themselves. Yeah. yeah, and ask them to speak to it. You know, you said this, this, and this. Where, where did that come from? Why did you feel that this was the number one biggest challenge facing Morristown? Can you please elaborate? So you're saying keep them in? And even though it's now public knowledge? I don't think it hurts. They can, you know, have time to prepare. Think about it. I want people to do research. Yeah. I, I, I want them to show that they're putting the time and there's no harm in that. You know, and they're going to be doing the job. Yeah. It's going to be part of the job. Yeah, so I, I, I would concur. I, I, at first, I, you know, I questioned how valuable that would really be. But um, I think the more I thought about it, um, I would leave that in as part of the 
as part of the uh, process. Yeah. And okay. Paula, you do not think this, and Eric, we don't need to officially vote on this. This is just a procedure. Not unless you're going to make it a policy. And I don't know that this needs to be a policy. A procedure is simply a guiding document, a guiding tool for this. Yeah. And it would change. It would change for every hiring you might have to do. Yeah, I, I mean, so. I think, yeah, I, I don't want to see it be a policy. Yeah. If we're going to do a policy, then yeah. we need to step away from the TA position and yeah. look at it at a much higher level of the hiring <coughs> practices in general. But a, a procedural is, I, I don't think we need to make that formal. Yeah. I think that Travis and I can continue to work through this. You know, if we get additional feedback or ideas, we can absolutely adjust it as we go along. Yeah, and it gives the hiring committee a, the latitude to and then, modify it and change it yes. if they see if they see so. And if you guys are discussing this route that maybe you change your mind about the video, maybe you change your mind or there's another area that you feel would be important to add, we can add it without having to, you know, constantly bring it back to the slide where we can share it amongst the group. Yeah. Yeah. I think the balance of the information in this um, as a fluid document um, summarizes everything that we've discussed up to this point as well. So thank you both for, for yeah. putting this together. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. I've enjoyed working with you. <laughs> you, as, you as well. Thank you. Um, do you want to talk to this uh, particular piece, Tom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tell us who you are. Tom uh, On the advertising for this job, uh, right now we have a cost of around 93 to 100 and some. What I would like you to consider is lowering that down to 80,000 to maybe 93, and also including uh, the, the, uh, the job, the TA, with the possibility of, tra of transitioning into the uh, town manager. But as you may know, I may not know, there is a petition uh, to to uh, to change uh, the TA to town manager, and that could come to the vote at the same time as the uh, budget. So just be prepared for that. I would suggest maybe putting that uh, language in the advertisement, and searching for the for the future TA, with the understanding it could move uh, to the town manager. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there, um, is there, because of, um, as you know, I'm in favor of looking at having a manager. I'm just wondering, because the, there is a very legal process that we have to go through, um, I'm just, you know, I don't want to mislead somebody because it's a long process to, to potentially get to having a manager. I, I see what you're saying. I think it would lure in more people. I just want to be careful that if um, Chris could speak to this, um, the actual process of going from a, I think you can speak to this, right? Um, well, I mean, Morristown can do it uh, fairly quickly. With, with a vote. Uh, of, I mean, the community would have to vote this through as, uh, as a new form of government. Um, you know, I think the, the thing that people need to bear in mind is, is that whether you have a town administrator, um, a form of government, uh, or a town manager, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that because you move to a town manager form of government that, that the pool of applications suddenly gets much better, um, nor does it mean that you're going to find somebody that um, might have a master's in public administration. Um, what it means is, is that whoever sits in the chair has a different set of responsibilities um, moving forward. So um, certainly if you're thinking that you, the community is going to move forward into a town manager uh, form of government, um, I think that the salary level needs to be where it is because quite frankly, you're probably going to be paying more than that for a town manager who comes with specific yes. qualifications. I mean, Waterbury just hired a town manager who was uh, worked for the city of St. Albans um, as a finance director, um, and their starting salary is 115000 plus 
plus benefits with no you know specific managerial experience in terms of being a town manager so I think that um, you know we'll I think that it's a discussion that we need to have I think people need to understand exactly uh, what a town manager can or cannot do and also um, that just because you have a town manager form of government doesn't guarantee you that you're going to be able to find somebody that has a master's in public administration that it may be someone more homegrown. So, uh, the because uh, that was also a concern is that there um, there is an educational uh, and discussion process that we do need to go through so that everybody's clear about what we're doing. Well, um, there's a guideline. I mean, you, you can yeah. see statute. It oh, I know. What the I'm town just saying we is. have discussed that on this board that <coughs> that we wanted to have you know public discussion so everybody's aware before rather than just throwing out a vote. That's my it understanding. Good if it's so the hang on. Um, so Paula, just quickly, um, yeah. I was looking through uh, and reviewing. Um, is it necessary that we put? a range or because I know I was looking through LinkedIn and different things and they they basically put down there was some very big things and they were saying you know pay commensurate to experience or is there a wording or what are your thoughts on that? so we could I mean we can say pay based on experience <laughs> I used a range um, because you have to live within the budget so, <laughs> so mine was more looking at the budget and not wanting to put, I mean, we can, put, we can do whatever the select board would like to do, but we, we have a budget that we have to live within. Yeah. So uh, those are the numbers that I use. Uh -huh. We can put it out there and maybe we would be more attractive mm -hmm. if we put pay based on experience and maybe we're not getting the applicants that we could be getting because the salary for that position and the job duties are, uh, not where they should be right now um you know so we've had that conversation i gave you data from the lct that showed that town managers make significantly more significantly more than what our current town administrator is making so i can change it to be whatever i keep reposting stuff so that mm -hmm. it stays fresh um because i also think that if by chance you know i i love having options so if somebody willingly wants to come in here who has who we like and they're good with seventy thousand, let's not pay them ninety three. I mean, let's be optimistic about this. Who's yeah. coming? Yeah. I think what we the final okay. offer is going to be dependent on what we decide as or yeah. you decide. So if we um, if Travis and I who have been working on reviewing these and applications, resumes, cover letters, determine that we're going to interview the maybes just because we've set a range of this doesn't mean that we can't look at the person's experience and background and education and say this is the range but you don't need that that qualifications and the salary. Um, so I think there's some movement there. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. So, so you don't think that it's <laughs> potentially uh, limiting us or putting us to pay more than uh, I, I, think, you, uh, I don't think it is um, going to require us to pay more than um, just because we put that salary out there doesn't mean that we have to pay that um, it's to give the individual that is looking for a job a real idea idea okay. of what we're willing to pay um, maybe on the higher end of that, when I say that, it, we may have individuals who are looking at that pay range and saying that's not enough for that job requirement, you know, job description mm -hmm. or job duties. So I don't know because mm -hmm. I'm not out there looking at it going, you know, that's a really not, yeah. that's not a high enough for well, <laughs> yeah, 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 especially people that go along with the job. So I don't, in I don't cities know. that don't understand. Yeah. So the numbers I put out there were based on. Okay. Right, and honestly, we'd be lucky to get to the point where we actually are in a negotiating place yeah. because we're so not anywhere near that yet. I would be, um, you know, I've been sharing the yeah. application resumes um, with Travis, and um, we did advertise in seven days as we all agreed upon, which was eleven hundred dollars, and we received two resumes from that, um, and. That's where we stand right now. And I, like I said, I am refreshing those ads so that they pop up and generate and um, 
but it's not a lot of movement. I can't tell you why. I don't know if it's There's because the, the there isn't the individual looking for it. I don't know if it's because of the dynamics in our town. Travis, we've talked about this in the mm -hmm. past, making our you know right now we have a reputation in Morrisville. Um, people watch these meetings. They know what's going on. They know that we don't have a past budget. So is that impacting? <laughs> the lack of activity, I don't know. Is it the pay scale? I don't know. I don't. I wish I knew that because then I could correct it, but I, won't, I don't know any of it. So should we hold off for a bit um, on running the ANDS? Um, where, are, I mean, does it make sense to keep putting good money into that? So I did not run the seven days again right. um, because yeah. of the cost of that. I was really hoping um, that we were going to receive more interest through that um, advertisement, but that did not happen. And um, I've held off in the local newspaper because we all agree that at this point, I'm doing it three, four weeks. If we were going to receive any local activity, um, we would have received it by now. So it's really um, the other areas that I've been just making sure that they're still, you know, posted. Our website, ICNA. Uh, we serve indeed I just reposted it again so that it like moves up to the top of the yeah. but that in itself is expensive yeah. um, and what are you you know what are, is summer going to hurt I mean do executives look for jobs during summer how they you know they say everything's cyclical um, do we think that summer could be affecting us I think summer is a better time than the holidays. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good yeah. point. People, yeah. people with children want to relocate during the summer so that's the kids true. can start okay. school. I certainly don't think the time's hurting yeah. us. Okay. I don't know why there isn't. I don't, you know, I, I'm starting to see in other positions that we have open. I'm starting to see the qualified um, highway applicants. Yeah. Um, you know, we have we have received, um, you know, applications for. Um, the police department, I would say that it's a small um, percentage it's of dark. certified police officers you know, um, applying here. So I, I, don't, I, don't know. Um, I don't know. We're seeing it in other towns too. I mean, Jericho, Waterbury, um, Essex Junction, none of them hired anyone with prior manager or administrator experience. Right. Most of the folks. Yeah, if you go on BLCT and you look at there's, yeah. there's quite a few um, you know, municipal positions that are yeah. open. So another reason why be very gentle with your staff. Well, uh, question for you. Um, I know that there's been some discussion too about uh, interim uh, administrator. Um, have you had any success at this point? Um, yes. So um, not anymore. I did reach out to um, Tom, who was the um, reference that I received from the LCT. Um, I've not heard back from him just to see where he's at in his schedule. Um, when I had last, last talked to him a couple, two, three weeks ago, he had, it sounded like a pretty um, full plate. Uh, he did in his email say that because he's two hours north of us that he would require that we pay for lodging. Um, so I don't know what our budget's going to look like. Again, we don't have a budget, so to try and work within a budget that we don't have um, is a little difficult. Um, so for that, I'm waiting to hear back from him. I did receive um, an email from an outfit in Montpelier. Um, I just received it. I don't know if I have it here. Um, who works? Um, with municipal um, municipalities um, with interim, I just got it yesterday. So I did email them um, and am going to do a, uh, a, a phone uh, consult with them just to see. I e emailed asking what they offer, what their procedures are, um, and the cost because I found that the headhunting is very expensive. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, we've already spent a significant amount of money advertising um, for this position. Yeah, well, I'm glad Chris asked this question about an interim because, again, I think this is where we're probably going to end up. It doesn't look like we have a lot of, a lot, it looks like we've probably already saturated that potential market that might be out there to come in, you know, someone to come in and be a full time administrator. But these interims, uh, 
I mean, who knows what's out there, but. Do you have to give it a hope? <laughs> is, is word of mouth go, going anywhere at this point? You know, at this point, sense? maybe you should start, um, you know, telling your staff that you'll, you know, pay them something if they can recommend somebody. I don't know. But it's a brilliant process. I, I think that, Sorry, you know, I've said it back, I think, in May. You know, we really should have probably by now had a plan B in place um, for if we didn't hire someone. Now we're down to two weeks less than two weeks and um, we we have no plan um, is how I feel. I feel that like Eric has implemented a plan um, with the staff so that we know what we're, you know, what direction we're going to move in in his absence, but um, was, yeah. was there somebody from Richmond that was, I know that a name has been tossed around uh, who was a former uh, administrator or manager from Richmond? Not yeah. Richmond. So I spoke to um, the, an individual from Waterbury um, who was not available until late fall. Um, I have not followed up with him um, just because I'm not sure what direction I'm going in. So. Have you spoken to uh, somebody of the name of Rick? Yeah. I'm not sure I have my information correct. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't ring a bell. Um, I don't think we're going to say, but I'm going to be working with this outfit from Montpelier, sorry, um, as soon as I get information on what they have to offer, um, I will share it as quickly as I can. And you said you just heard from them today? I did, yes. Mm -hmm. Great, thank I you, I was an email and um, responded to the email directly to them just asking for information, so they um, responded right before I came down. Um, and we're going to move forward with the phone call and see what goes from there. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Paula. Thank okay. Just reintroduce yeah. yourself. By anyone at town manager, I think it, it can't hurt. Maybe somebody out there looking to be a town manager. And just because we get a petition signed, and we get a vote doesn't mean the, the town folks are going to want a town manager. So, I mean, you can't. Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and say there's going to be a town manager at the table. Who knows? Uh, I, I personally hope to just have it, given the, the town the opportunity to decide one way or the other uh, and, uh, and, and be prepared. The board should be prepared in case the, the town does want a town manager. Uh, a town manager rather than a, a TA. Mm -hmm. But uh, by that advertising, I mean, who knows, maybe there is one up here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, yeah. we're spending a million dollars on the advertising. Season, so, okay. Know, yeah. 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 okay, ready to move to <coughs> approve the warrants. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if, it, do we need to make an action on it? On what? Um, the ads right now. I don't, do the we need agenda, to? You know, the agenda items about the hiring procedures. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't looking for anything about the, I don't know, that. Okay. It was just more the procedure that okay. uh, Travis and I created and so, just making sure that you guys are okay. reviewing it and making recommendations okay. what you want to change yeah. or add or. Okay, so just for Tom, it's not off the table. We're just not making going forward with that really as a discussion tonight is that correct going forward with what with talking about town changing, manager changing the ad changing the ad i'm not going to change the ad or i would not say it like that um <laughs> if you guys tell me to change the ad we can change the ad but i think at this point it would be false advertisement because we don't have a town manager position we have a town administrator that's, position that was what so i was afraid of. Where, if the if that changes because that's what the community votes on, um, then at that point we would need to have, we could change the ads if they, if we have not already filled the position. Um, and if we have someone in that position, then we would need to um, provide a new job description, um, allow them the opportunity to agree to the new job description. And if not, then we would start the hiring process again. So I think that we have to be very careful about um, for advertising for something for a position that doesn't currently the timing's the timing's weird. I love right. keeping yeah. the option open, but yeah, we have to be careful that we're not misleading somebody. Right. Not saying that we can't yeah. change things or job descriptions when and if that time comes, but for now, I 
think we need to advertise for the position that we're hiring for. Yeah. And I think uh, Chris is, is correct in saying that it's not about the person's qualifications, it's about the, uh, our governance, what we've chosen as governance. So the person, a TA, a town administrator can move right in to be a town manager because it's the responsibility that's changed, not the qualifications. I think we've, I think we've covered um, either scenario with our um, advertisement and our education requirements and our background requirements. I think that if and when we get anyone um, that has the appropriate qualifications, I think both of the town administrator and town manager qualifications would both be met. I don't have any concern there. Yeah. Well. Ready to move to approve the warrants. Looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the warrants. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion has passed. And any department head reports? But any, I don't know, Bill, if you were around when we talked yeah. about this. Okay. You may. Have we ever done this before? So. We have not. Oh, I should. I should yeah, stop. I, I, I kind of talked to Judy and added this to yeah. the agenda so that the public and we could get some mm -hmm. feedback from our department heads if they choose to share with us yeah. maybe some okay. good news or concerns yeah. they have. Um, I, I don't have anything to really talk about department wise. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about three families: my family, my EMS family, and my work family. Um, day after Memorial Day, we left for five days uh, to take my two-year-old to Sesame Place in Pennsylvania, of all places. Um, returning, we visit Grandma in Connecticut. Uh, and he got a little out of sorts, didn't feel well. And what you don't expect when you're on vacation 250 miles away is to have an emergency department physician tell you that your two-year-old has a large abdominal mass. Um, and just whether, whether you believe in Sherlock or Divine Providence, uh, the closest hospital that we had gone to with him that night was Yale Children's Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and again, Sherlock, Divine Providence, we end up at one of the top ten children's hospitals following the world. Uh, my EMS family, um, I'm a working chief, like Jason, he's a working chief. Um, uh, uh, we're all, you know, we're, we're responders uh, uh, in addition to, to being administrators. So it puts a hole on the schedule. And after an hour of sleep, uh, I made three phone calls. Uh, I called Corey, my assistant chief, um, told, told her what was going on. <coughs> Uh, Eric took a total hot mess phone call from me at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning uh, that I didn't know when I would be back to work. Uh, that first day was yesterday. Uh, my EMS family here, my EMS, EMS family in this district that supported my people, that supported Corey, uh, my greater work family, Paula, Tina, uh, the people that frankly have taken a lot of incoming fire over the last few months. Um, there's not a department in this town that did not check in with me. And I, I, just, I just cannot express to you folks as our elected leaders the value of being an employee, of being a staff member in a town that rallied around me and my family from 250 miles away. And I, I just, I can't put that into tangible words. Um, I, I can't put that into tangible feelings. The good news is, is again, by sheer luck, the on-call surgeon that we get Yellow Haven is probably one of the top ten <coughs> leading experts on solid tumors in children in the world. And by luck of the 
drawer, she took my son to the operating room, got it out completely. Pathology report came back last week that it's benign. Oh, great. Uh, but uh, for two weeks, um, this agency ran like a top, thanks to Corey, thanks to Eric, thanks to my work family. And I, I just can't tell you guys enough, those of you who checked in with me, these people who checked in with me, it's, it's, it's not unnoticed. It may be unappreciated and unnoticed by some, but when you're in the trenches with these folks every day and have this kind of experience, uh, I, there's no budgetary value to that. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to hear that. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Is there anybody else? <laughs> um, town administrator's report. Uh, short and sweet. I had one of the greatest uh, hours of my uh, two years here last Friday when I was uh, delivered a, a class to our four counselor leaders that are going to be running the recreation program and gave them a class of leadership. And uh, the, the input back and forth was amazing for the, the age of these folks. Uh, we had one who was in college and three headed to college. Uh, and I feel very, very good about the quality of uh, care and oversight that they're going to provide during the program. Uh, their ability to communicate with each other is excellent. Uh, and with Anna, so uh, I think they've been very well selected through our process, and uh, it was it was just a joy to, to interact with them, to hear their their take on what they felt leadership was, and it was it was a great uh, great event. Uh, next week is the grand opening for the Village Center Apartments. Um, there's quite an event planned for that music. Uh, Creamies, the first 100 creamies are free. <laughs> I'll race you to the front of the line. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's uh, going to be held right on uh, Hutchin Street, right in front of the building itself. A lot of guest speakers. I think it starts at 1 on the 27th, right? I believe so. 1 to 4 on the 27th. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let me add the most recent vandalism that we've been working through here on the Oxbow Park, the bathrooms, and the pavilion. We, uh, through grant monies that were obtained by Tricia and donations made from a fund that the, uh, the village trustees oversee, monies were given to us to install a uh, monitoring system down there. Several cameras were installed. Uh, the cost was in the area of ten thousand dollars total and they have been up for a month Probably. Also. and someone went into the pavilion and destroyed the control heads yanked all the wires out the cameras are still in place because they're too up, up too high but the system itself has been dismantled uh, not the first act of vandalism down there but the one that's substantial so we're waiting on a uh, estimate from the installers for the cost of replacing that to see whether or not it's worth an insurance claim or not. Uh, we'll, we'll see going from there. The more uh, bothersome is our bathrooms. They have become uh, a constant headache. Our highway department above and beyond and outside of their job description went in to unclog a toilet. Someone had taken two full rolls of toilet paper and stuffed them down the toilet, defecated on top of that and left the mess. Mm -hmm. Kevin went down and took care of that mess for us. And I told him, it's the last time he's going to do that. We're going to hire professionals to do this. And we did. The next week we had to do it again because the toilet was clogged with socks. Because the toilet paper is being stolen out of there, people are using socks instead of toilet paper. So we are order we've ordered locking toilet paper dispensers for inside of there. Uh, the trash receptacles down there have feces-laden socks thrown in them for those that are environmentally conscious enough not to flush them. Uh, it's pretty disgusting. We've had to hire our cleaning lady to come in and do special cleanings at added expense to the taxpayers 
Jason is currently working on uh, coming up with sample ordinances from other communities for a curfew down in the park to better enable his officers to be able to have some authority to run people out of there. Um, the bathrooms are locked every night. Uh, it's on an app on Judy's phone. Uh, she, over the weekend, had to call the police because someone went to the bathroom and her app indicated the door had been locked for a length of time. Had to call the police to have them go down and check out and make sure somebody was not, you know, hurt or in there doing something they shouldn't be. So it has just uh, become a more than a bit of a headache down there. And we will, uh, you will likely see from someone in the near future a proposal to uh, open the bathrooms during the, the period of events that we have, scheduled events only, which is sad because the folks on the rail trail have been, yeah. have liked this. Yeah. Um, but the expense of the taxpayers is, is getting ridiculous. So uh, there, anybody that wants to use, utilize the, the Oxbow Park for an event down there will make this a part of their uh, package, so to speak, for, for usage and make them available then. But uh, wait and see what the end, end result is. But we've got a bill at county funding heating to pay along with the cleaning bill and lost toilet paper. But anyway. I, I might suggest that that in the interim that those bathrooms be locked unless there's a special event going on down there, period. That um, this has gotten way out of hand and, and the expense of those bathrooms alone to construct and then have this kind of activity continue. Um, the unfortunate piece is that few people are ruining it for everybody, but um, it's it's, you know, Eric, you've spoken to me about it. Um, it seems like uh, it's untenable at this point. And I would make a suggestion that those bathrooms are locked unless there's a special event in that area and then they're locked afterwards. Is there any talk about, um, having been down there, I've watched quite a bit of activity and the stage has become a, uh, meeting transition is there any do we need to talk about and jason and just locking it down you know, i think we need uh we need a curfew i, I got essex and newports uh gave the trish she's kind of working on it together we're working on it we get a curfew down there we find somebody there after nine o'clock ten o'clock and we write them a ticket and they keep coming back and they trust pass yeah, because Burlington's got the, um, an open band shell that has bathrooms and uh, where they do the concerts. And I'm, I'm pretty sure those bathrooms are not open, uh, but it is an open band shell. And it might be worth checking to see if they have issues. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. I don't know how we could close this band shell. I guess I mean, anything's possible, but what's... It'd be expensive. It's it's cheap. Cheap. Yeah. yeah. I would second what Chris suggested of locking them right now. Oh, I would say locking them, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree as well. Can I, Trish is on, on the line here. And oh, there she is. Yeah, so I would like her to speak. Trish, would you like to say something? Yeah, I, I just jumped on as I've been watching this and listening to this whole conversation. Um, I think it would be wise for us to think about how to close off our band shell. I know everyone just said it's expensive. I understand that. They, they, the state just came out with one of the facilities grants, building facilities. This may be an option for us. It's a 50-50 grant. I will look into it further and we can talk about different options. Maybe it'd be wise if I talk to Kevin and we look at how we think we could do this. Because I think if we could shut off our pavilion in some possible way, we're gonna alleviate a lot of these problems. I am at the park a lot and I, I see this and you know, my heart just goes out because you know, from the beginning when I started this job, Oxbow Park was a big one for me. It was like, you know, it wasn't a great park to start with. And I felt like we brought it to a new level and this recent um, tragedies, I should say, it's just not good. So I think we need to look at some of our options instead of like saying, okay, we're going to immediately close our bathrooms. Let's let's look to see how we can solve some of these problems right now. But it might be in the in the interim, Trish, is to close the bathrooms until there's a, unless there's a function down there. Yeah, the problem is, Jude, and as everyone knows, 
there's um there's soccer down there on a regular basis like every day of the week there's um wednesday night live there we have rentals now we have there's just a lot going on at the park and when i went down two weeks ago on a saturday there was not a place you could even park down there with the rail trail just opening and that's now on the state maps as our place that you can park for the rail trail to use it so i i don't want us to jump on that too quickly because i think that we need to really look at this and you know, the rail trail is really a, a, a big um, driver for the town of Morristown. And we better reap the benefits of this right now. Would it be more costly, cost effective for us to have just a porta potty until we yeah, get a, yeah. a definite change? I, I know. I've been thinking about that. Hey, can we just put this on a burner? Can I do a little research on it? And can we uh, come back to this one? Yeah. I, When's the governor and Bernie coming through? Bernie, my bud buddy. July 15th. Yeah, we Sorry. need to, just thinking, we want to have bathrooms <laughs> available we'll on the 15th. Yeah, we can open them for that day. Yeah, we'll open them for that day. No, and we don't have to have bathrooms for that day. If we have a portal light down there, we're fine with that too. We do not, dude, this is not, you know, I mean, I know what you're saying, Laura, but I, if, if we have to have a portal at for it, that's what we have to do. I, I think we need to be thinking of the general public and our community more than we need to think about because the governor's come to Morristown. I mean, I, I think that's a big event, but I, I do think we need to think on the long range plans, not on short range. So your short range, you're thinking, you, you wanna look into this further. I'm just wanting short term, do we keep the bathrooms closed unless there's a, a function going on? I, I would I would agree with that. I think that I with all the damage and the stuff that's gone on down there, I don't see putting the brakes on a, you know closing those bathrooms until there's a maybe a, a different plan or or a proposal. I just assume nip that in the bud right now, and if there's some other proposal that can work, a huge then cost for us. And, and do that. Um, then I would be in favor of that. But I, I think in the short run, um, this is an untenable situation and costly for the taxpayers, and I, I don't you know, subscribe to it. Okay, as long as um, they're willing to put a uh, portal in there immediately. We don't have a budget. Is that what you're looking at, Judy? A portalette? No, she's okay. looking. She's looking at the schedule for the lock and unlock of the bathroom doors down there. Because the kids oh. that are down. Because oh, so, down. Um, yeah, because I this weekend I worked. This weekend, not that I wanted to, and I worked because I had to pay attention to the bathroom locks down there. And that's what I'm looking at right now. I'm not my phone. The app on my phone tells me when that door is unlocked and when that door is locked. So. I saw suspicious behavior on the locking and the unlocking and had to call dispatch over the weekend. And when the cleaner went in, the cleaner found, couldn't get in because there was somebody sleeping in front of the door. And the cleaner wasn't able to get through to clean the bathrooms. And the police had to go down and remove somebody. So I can tell you folks right now, I don't get paid enough money to monitor an app for the bathrooms, just so the public knows. So Judy, okay. are you recommending we should lock them now or well, not lock them? I think the them? bathrooms, I agree with Trish, I think we need to do more research. What I've been doing is I've been locking the bathrooms and, and unlocking the bathrooms at different times throughout the day so that there's not a set schedule that people can rely on. We know the bathrooms lock every night at this time because we, you know, because yeah. people see that activity and know they can't get in after a certain hour. Uh -huh. So I, it rained this weekend. So one of these days this weekend, I don't remember what day it was, I locked the bathrooms. Since it's raining, there's no need. Yeah. We're going to have somebody sleeping in them tonight. Yep. So I locked them up instead. But I'm doing that at home when I shouldn't be working. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I'd like to find a better solution. I've talked with Trisha a little bit about this. I'd like to find a better solution for this. Mm. Um, but right now, this is what we have going on because I care about yeah. the rail trail. I care about Oxbow Park. 
I care about our community having a nice, safe place to go. I hate using a Poilet, so if I don't have to use a Poilet and we have these bathrooms, I'd rather use those. Um, but this is becoming, this is out of control. Yes. And so, uh, I, you know, I hate to see them closed. Um, Anna texted me this morning, first thing this morning. She's got socket key up there this week. We need, can we have the bathrooms open? So what do you do so that the bathrooms are staying open for the community? Um, but boy, oh boy, I don't know. I'm a pretty flexible person sitting behind this table right now, pretty pissed off about it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Yeah. So can Anna not open the bathrooms while she's down there with the I soccer camp? I have the app on my phone. <laughs> you don't want too many people, too many no, cooks. No, so there's no keys or anything. It's we don't phone. use, we have an app. There's a, a, a key lock on it, but. The cleaning lady has a key. Yeah, the cleaning lady has a key. But we don't, you know. But it doesn't matter. I, mean, I unlock the bathrooms, I unlock the bathrooms. What I'm saying is, it is that the issue is, is that it's becoming middle of the afternoon on a Sunday that I'm getting bothered yeah, by should. this. Yeah. Okay, so that's the problem is what do we do to fix this? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and still have bathrooms for the community. Yeah. You know, because that's, you know, it's important. Trish? So there there is six master keys for that bathroom, um, as, as we all know. Well, some of us know. <laughs> I, I believe Kevin has one. I have one myself. Judy has a master key with another one that we give out for when uh, people rent the park and they're using the bathrooms. Um, we give that key out. They're responsible for the bathrooms. Um, I, I think there's a uh, maybe one or two more maybe at the town. I don't know. But I, I think there were six issued originally, and they're just master keys. It, it, it could happen that Anna could have a key because she does have events like we do for any other event, the Tom Moog events. He's given a key that has a key to the gates and a key to the bathroom. So he's responsible for it. He's responsible for bringing extra toilet paper. We we only take on so much about this when we put our park agreement together. So I do think there is keys that could be handed out, but I want to be very careful because when you're leaning into a, another whole big disaster, when you're asking for Judy to hand out keys for events, because you have someone who says, oh, we're going to be down there for half an hour for a picnic, or we're going to be there. So I just think we need to think heavily about this one. And not only that, but also to Trish, the key opens up the inside door where all yes. the supplies are for the cleaning. I've got a summer's worth of toilet paper down there right now. Is it yeah. going to still be there? I mean, I'm just, yeah, it's no. just, it's, yeah. Physical it's keys can be copied too if we're talking physical. These ones, yeah, these they ones can. say on them do not. Well, they yeah. could so, still be, Some they people will still do it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, but anybody with, you know, Luxmas, it does say on it not to duplicate. But still. Can the app do like a scheduling program? Like can not, this, not right now. Scheduling. We've tried. But and even so, you don't really, that's the whole problem. They it's not know. a schedule that people yeah. get used to. So I've been doing it intermittently <clears throat> so that, you know, 8 o'clock every morning, 8 o'clock every night, you're going to hear my alarm go off in 20 minutes if we're still here. <laughs> about those combination locks? It has a, it has a number pad on it. So you okay. can, you can, but how many people do you want to give the combination to? How many it. times do I change it? So. <laughs> So we, we haven't made any decisions. Suggestion is a porta potty down there. That's um, portalette or whatever until we get this problem solved. Until we get a curfew, right, yeah. Jason? Yeah. Right. What? Can can we decide this internally as staff? And yes. Internally, does this really need to be a select board decision? I no. think I think between us, we we all have a, a very straightforward thinking process about this but i think we can solve the problem easier than right here with the whole community sounds good to me okay thank you works for travis Thanks, Laura. Yep. yep yes yeah i'd Calls. be curious to see what they come up okay with. sounds good to all of us trish <coughs> thank you um select board comments 
Who would like to start? Yeah. Travis, I'm looking at you. Sure. I can say after that uh, shitty conversation, <laughs> I don't have much to, uh, to say. <laughs> um, no, I wanted to just say to, to you, Bill, incredibly happy to hear that your kiddo's doing well. Um, I have a four-year-old at home, and it, you know I choked up when I heard that. You don't even want to think about that happening to your child. So um, I did pass on my thoughts to Eric. I, I didn't reach out directly because I wanted to respect your privacy, um, but certainly I was thinking about you, and very, very happy to hear the outcome. So I'll leave it at that. I would. I want to say I'm sorry we lost the yoga studio, but I'm thrilled that Moss is moving in, and they will open. Um, July 4th. They're going to be a huge asset. Beautiful store, beautiful things. Um, she believes that um, her sales can support it, which is great for the neighborhood. Um, I'm also glad to report that Lost Nation has lived to see another day. Um, for those who don't realize, they were within two days of leaving the town. Um, they are a huge asset. Um, got caught in lots of uh, pandemic, other cycle things, uh, but have re completely restructured, revamped. They unfortunately have gone from 50 employees down to 10, uh, 12, but they've lived to see another day. So um, that's great. We didn't lose one. So, Good. and they're a great business. So. Yeah. Which one is going to go next? Go ahead. Um, I think it speaks volumes. Um, about this community and the support staff here in this um, in this office and the folks in the field in terms of what Bill had shared with us tonight in terms of his journey with his child and um, it uh, I think it heartens all of us to, to recognize that um, you know um, that people can rally together um, not just because of this event, but that you know this is a prime example of what this community can represent, and um, the people here in this um, office building and in the field. And I think it, uh, I think it's really a wonderful um, testimony, and, and we are all very grateful for the fact that um, your child is is uh, on the road to recovery and, and uh, it is certainly a parent and grandparents worst nightmare to think about something mm -hmm. like that happening um, on a business side uh, note um, one of the things that i've been thinking about here for a while and talk some with dawn and with eric is the um, village highway um, garage um, we are uh, three and a half years into a contract that pays about a hundred thousand, a little over a hundred thousand dollars a year in rent um, in that facility. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful building, and it suits our needs very well. But we'll never own it. Um, and uh, in another year and a half, we're going to be looking at possibly signing another contract um, for another five years. We have that option, I guess, available to us. Um, uh, with no real uh, specifications in terms of what that contract may look like uh, per cost per square foot. Um, I would suggest that we put, of everything else that we have on our stuff to do list here, that we begin to really think about um, an infrastructure change, uh, particularly up on Cochran Road, uh, look into the viability of adding on to that facility. I know that that facility needs a new heating plant now. Um, there's no sense in spending something on it if we're going to expand that, but I think that we need to look into all of those options um, because a half a million dollars spent um, over five years and then potentially spend another half a million um, is untenable to me. Um, so I think that um, we have proper money that's available to us to, to look into either design build or whatever we need to do. We have septic up there, we've got water up there, we've got space up there. And I think that um, we've got um, a finite amount of time to really look into this. And I think that um, although the budget is, is on our table right now, I think that we need to look beyond that because these are real tax dollars that we're spending. And it's, and it's a lot of money. And um, I would like to, um, you know, maybe dedicate some time at a future meeting to sit down and maybe put together a subcommittee to start looking at that um, and seeing what our possibilities are and uh, move forward because I think that's where serious money is spent. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Sounds good. I guess I would I would just like to echo what Bill was talking about earlier as well. Every time I come into this building, every time I I talk to Kevin over at Highway, <coughs> last year talking to Jason when I was the police liaison, I'm just constantly impressed with not just the hard work, but the quality of work that's being done by our employees here in town. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a rough ride for a couple of months, and I just give our employees so much credit for sticking it, sticking it out and, uh, and continuing to do the great work that, they, that they're doing. So thank you, for Bill, for bringing that up earlier, and thank you, Chris, for echoing similar, similar comments. I, too, um, as you said, we've talked about this idea of a garage, um, a village garage, and maybe moving, moving things up onto Cochrane Road. We're paying an awful lot of money for that village garage right now, and uh, it would be nice to consolidate that. And I would also say, and it was about a year ago that this came up, too, just the whole idea of a whole public service building. Um, police are also in pretty crammed quarters. Um, that building wasn't built for the police force that is currently using it. And they're doing a darn good job with this very small, limited space that they have. The amount of work and the technical work that, that our police officers are, are asked to do, um, that building just isn't, isn't suiting, suiting their needs. Well, it's not handicapped accessible either. No. Yes. No. No. Nor is it uh, designed to test for some of the drugs and some of the chemicals that <coughs> our police officers are constantly, uh, constantly surrounded by. So, and then the third thing, but this has been talked about a lot tonight, so I won't say much about this. But this whole idea of the town manager, I did, I have a, I did have a bunch I wanted to say on that. The one thing I would like to say though is I know that there's a petition out there. I saw it down at Guy's Farm and Yard many weeks ago. And I'm glad it's out there. I very much support the idea of moving to a town manager, or at least looking into a town manager kind of governance. I would just ask whoever those authors of the petition are to just hold on to it for a few weeks, a month. We've got a budget to get through. We don't need this right now as well. And. Uh, I'd really like us to be able to focus our efforts in that in that in that manner. But uh, as soon as we get this budget, I am I'm I'm all in to begin to look at moving on governance in that in that direction. That's it. Thank you. Well, to follow up on what you're saying is that, and and I'm sure Tom, you're aware of this is when a but a petition comes in to the town, we have X number of days to execute. To, to move forward. So it could cost the town a great deal of money to look at this, go forward on this process instead of looking at it uh, taking place during a time period when we're already doing um, a budget, or we're all, I'm sorry, already doing voting. And we, and we also want to have time to educate the public on the differences between a town administrator and a town manager and to have a time frame to do that. So a petition could force the issue it forces the issue, but it's going to cost the taxpayers more money than necessary. Um, it's not the point. So, I'm, I'm aware of those things. It's not the point to push something forward, just to push it forward. Okay, I hope not. Um, and I, I, I'm glad to hear that he's <clears throat> doing so well. Oh, great. Um, answer to prayers. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to say, um, uh, but, but thank you. Uh, time for uh, community comment. We changed it from com community concerns to comments because sometimes people don't have concerns, but they may have some comments they'd like to make. And Tony, you have your hand up first. <coughs> so first of all, I recognize Bill, and I think I take advantage of the three ambulances. <laughs> um, Tony from Morristown, and just to address Chris's on the highway garage, I think all that needs to be done is a 10 or a 12 stall lean to with solar panels. Those trucks should be parked outside in the wintertime, plugged in. We probably get a lot more years out of them because when they're parked inside, 
as we all know. So works for us. So I think we could do something real reasonable with with that highway garage by parking all that equipment outside. Park what needs to be inside, inside. I think that garage is big enough for twelve employees. Just an opinion. Thanks, Tony. Okay. And I got one more. Has the town ever explored the idea of contracting out snowplow drivers with with the town's equipment? I think Paula's doing an excellent job here, hiring and firing employees or whatever she does. <laughs> she does that. I think we can save a lot of money if if, if the if the snowplow truck drivers were contracted out, and, I'm, and I mainly say that because in the winter, there's a lot of people that have their backhoe and their, and their uh, dump trucks, and they're looking for work in the wintertime. Now just shoot that out there, I think there should be some math done on that. And then we could downsize, we could also downsize on town employees. I guess my only question with that would be twofold. Um, whether that would violate any agreement that we have in terms of union contracts and how that would play out in terms of liability insurance and uh, our insurance through VLCT. I don't know if, um, you know, from a, another, any other aspect. Um, I'd, I'd kind of like to see the map, that's all. Sure. They'd, see, they'd, they'd, yeah, they'd probably have to carry personal liability insurance yeah, personal would be my liability. guess, which is gonna be a hindrance. It's going to be what? It would be a hindrance making them carry their own liability insurance. Well, that's why we're going to have a town manager. I mean, because he can check into it. I work for the Union Bank and they check me out all the time. It's, it's called responsibility. Yeah. Anyways, I'd just like to throw it out there for a math issue. Sure. Well, you're the highway guy. And you're math and, too, aren't you? I am. All right, you got two. And, and two. Uh, Laura, to, to address your deal with the gravel and the ditches, the ditches should be contracted out too because the ditch work is not getting done in this town at all. I go on a lot of back roads and all the ditches need work. It's not getting done. I don't see any hands up um, on uh, the screen. No hands up. Oh, Chrissy. It's identify yourself, please. Thank you. um, I was just reading this uh, jointly reported reports, <coughs> and I'm confused. Maybe I'm not reading this right, but in the yellow highlighted section where it says <coughs> appointed board and committee members are prohibited from serving on other select board and trustee jointly appointed, appointed boards and committees, to me that's basically saying if you're on the DRB, you can't also be on the planning commission. It doesn't say you can't be on the select board or you can't be on the board because those are not appointed positions. You're very clever. So I don't think that is saying what the intention is. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> not going to accomplish much.